Okay, good morning, everyone. It's 830. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, my name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and the first item will be an executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of uh, announcements. First, I wanted to let folks know that on September 23rd from 11 to 1230 uh, PM, the Vermont Agency of Human Services, AHS, is holding a virtual town hall meeting to discuss plans for seeking an, a one-year extension of the all-pair ACO model agreement, which is effective January 1, 2017 through December 31, 2022. The state is not seeking to add any additional services such as Medicaid home and community-based services, mental health services, and substance use disorder services to the all-pair financial target services, which are subject to growth targets. Additional forms about improving alignment between the delivery and financing of these services with services provided through the ACO will be discussed. The meeting will be uh, accessed through virtually through Teams, and the board is sending out that invitation to all of our advisory groups, as well as posting it on our website. I also, as I've uh, mentioned uh, in previous meetings, the board is, is uh, continuing to accept public comment on a potential next agreement through our website. And we will be sharing any of those comments with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations with the federal government. And that is all I have to report out this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Susan. At this point, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Patrick Rooney and we'll get right into the business at hand. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, board members, uh, stakeholders and members of the public. Um, welcome to the uh, September 13th, 2021 uh, deliberations. Um, before we get started, I um, want to acknowledge the work that the team has done this year. Um, COVID has produced uh, immeasurable uh, hurdles for both the hospitals and the regulators uh, as we navigate these budget processes. And it's really caused the team to have to refocus its energies and find um, new ways to uh, provide information and capture information for board members and members of the public. And Kate and Lori have been remarkable in that capacity this year. Um, I sincerely hope we don't have to uh, be that creative next year in, in getting some of this information together. But 14 hospitals worth of budgets is a lot of information, and they've done a remarkable job. Um, Russ McCracken, our staff attorney, who's been embedded with us throughout this process this year, uh, this is his first go around, and he's still with us. Uh, that pleases me because he's been uh, an amazing asset uh, helping us troubleshoot throughout this process. So, Russ, thank you so much. We really look forward to working with you uh, in our regulatory processes moving forward. And finally, Abigail Connolly, kind of the unsung hero of this process, who uh, is the reason um, that the documents that we collect and compile become transparent. Uh, she handles all of that uh, as it relates to the website. She captures the minutes for the meeting, and she's going to be transitioning to a new role here at the Green Mountain Care Board. So this is probably her last hurrah, and we just wanted to give a big shout out to her for her support. Uh, so with that, uh, board members, uh, we are going to transition into <clears throat> deliberations on Springfield Hospital. Uh, Kate Hoffman will be walking you through that, uh, and she'll give you a recap. There's been some amendments to their budget um, since they were in here for their budget hearing a couple of weeks ago. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kate. Good morning, everyone, and happy Monday. Um, to start this off, we wanted to show Springfield's original submission, which is what you're seeing on slide 105 here. So their original request for their FY22 budget was about $54.6 million, which was a 7.8% increase over the 21 budget and a 20.7 increase over the 21 projection. The change in charges were laid out um, as follows on the right with an 8.3% overall charge master increase. So with um, Springfield's revision, they um, realized that their Medicaid price um, impact was a bit high, so they revised that down. Their dish payments were reclassified and the Medicare price increase was also adjusted down 
which leads us to our next slide, which is their updated um, budget submission, which here you can see is about $53.6 million, which is a 5.9% um, increase over their 21 budget and an 18.5% increase over their projection. As noted in yellow below, the increase um, the revised increase over 21 budget is still over the 3.5 growth rate guidance. Um, in the change in charges, these did shift a bit. Um, the 8.3 overall charge master increase did not. Um, that has stayed the same. And then when we look at the bottom left-hand corner in our trending graph, um, they're much closer to um, where they're trended at 3.5 percent since 2019 but they still are over um, where we're trending there um, their justifications were as follows the mprm rate increases that are needed to continue in their recovery um, they need to ensure operations remain sustainable in fy22 they want to continue to ensure access to essential community hospital services their rate request will present, prevent excuse me, the exhaustion of cash instead of increasing cash. They have workforce volatility, which we hear from um, all the hospitals, and it allows Springfield to fund high priority capital needs. So if we look at their waterfall graph here for their NPR, so their NPR is increasing about $3 million from the 21 budget. Um, $4.3 million of this is rate, um, which we showed on the previous slide. Um, 2.8 is bad debt and free care. And there's a significant offset in utilization of 3.9 million, which you can see in the orange there, and then a slight little piece um, to dish. So this is with their amended budget. Um, we're not, we're gonna continue just showing their new submission. Sorry, I should have um, clarified that. So with their operating expenses, they're increasing about 3.4 million, mainly due to travelers of about $921,000. Inflation increases of about um, $843,000, other of $836,000, and new positions of $796,000. Uh, the expenses are consistent, um, at least materially, with Springfield's original submission. It is noted with the decreasing utilization, uh, the increasing costs around travelers, locum tenants, and new positions um, caused us to take a bit more of a look at their operating expenses. And when it comes to their quarterly performance, so we don't have Q4, we made these graphs in Tableau based off of their June 30th, um, 2021 submissions and the projections that came with those. Um, they did not provide a um, projection there, so we're only looking at three quarters here. Um, if we use the submitted projection that they sent with their budget, it would estimate approximately $10.9 million in Q4 with a projected operating loss in total of almost $4 million. So they were operating kind of around Q1, I would say, um, with what they were anticipating in Q4. Um, the next slide is their historical performance. So this hospital has not met their budgets from FY 2016 through the 21 projection. Since 2016, Springfield has not exceeded $53 million in NPR um, or FPP. Springfield has on average missed their budgets from 2016 to 2021 projection by about 13%. Operating margins have been negative since FY 2017, but the FY 22 budget as submitted is showing a slight operating gain. However, um, the operating margin did deteriorate between their two submissions. Their original had about $1.9 million of margin and now has dropped to about 900,000 or 941,000. So to break down their change in charge requests, um, the NPR is increasing, the amount of NPR increasing due to charge again is about 4.3 million of the nearly $3 million increase. Every 1% they attribute about $513,000. 
you can see the increases in their service categories, actually decreases in um, hospital inpatient was going down about 2.2%, while um, outpatient is increasing 11%. This shows the breakdown, the payer portion shows the breakdown between payers. And you can see their average charge increases at the bottom there. So Springfield's average, five-year average charge increase from 2021 is the fourth highest of all hospitals and the third highest in median, which you can see the 4.1% there. So our next slide, slide 112, shows the net revenue collection rates for all pairs, um, gross to net. Uh, you can see it's slightly increasing in the FY22 budget from the projection with a large spike in 2020, as you see there, we do have a note that this is due to the inaccuracy of the FY2020 reporting as noted on the slide. We have some, we see some paramic shifts that are pretty large between FY21 projection um, with a slight shift from Medicaid to Medicare when compared to the 21 budget the 21 projection being in gray on the slide on the right. So now we have our recommendation. Um, so this organization emerged from bankruptcy and is a new organization now. The hospital is providing fewer services and we want to ensure the hospital's costs are controlled, which caused us some concern upon reviewing the materials as they are budgeting for over $53 million of NPR FPP, which as I noted earlier, has not been achieved since 2016 when they offered other services that they no longer do, like the birthing center, for example. Um, since publishing the slides, we received Springfield's updated days cash on hand, which was 11.3 days. Um, this assumes paying out 1.4 million for capital and all other budgeted costs. Excuse me, Caitlin. Can you yeah. hear me? This is the court reporter. I just dropped off and oh, um, I had to get back in. So I don't know, Mr. Mullen, if you want to go back, I can tell her where she left off. But I did miss some of it, obviously. That, that would be fine. Kim, go okay. ahead and let her know where she left off. And OK, so it's a little ways back here. So it says so Springfield's average five year average charge increase from 2021 is the fourth highest of all hospitals and the third highest in median, which you can see. And that's as far as I got. Okay, you can Thank see the 4.1% in the bottom. That's their average. Okay, we were, yeah, we were good on that slide. Um, this slide, slide 112, shows the net revenue collection rates for all payers, gross to net. It's slightly increasing from in the 22 budget from the 21 projection. Um, you can see there's a large spike in the 2020 actuals. This is due to inaccuracy of the FY2020 reporting as noted on the slide. We also see some paramic shifts that are pretty large from the 21 projection, but a slight shift from Medicaid to Medicare when compared to the 21 budget. So the projection is in gray, so you can see the movement. Um, and then our next slide, I think I covered everything I said, um, our recommendations. So this organization emerged from bankruptcy and is a new organization now. The hospital is providing fewer services and we want to ensure the hospital's costs are controlled. Um, which has caused us some concern upon reviewing the materials as they are budgeting for over $53 million in NPR FPP, which has not been achieved since 2016 when they offered services like the birthing center that they no longer offer. Since publishing the slides, we received Springfield's updated days cash on hand, which was 11.3 days. This assumes paying out $1.4 million for capital and all other budgeted costs. Upon consideration of the hospital's submission, we do not believe the hospital will be able to achieve an NPR FPP growth rate that was submitted. So we are proposing a 0% increase from the FY21 budget, which equates to almost 12% growth from the 21 projection. The NPR history of bank since bankruptcy does not support the organization operating at over $53 million. However, we recommend supporting them with a higher than average rate as the hospital navigates its way out of bankruptcy and with new leadership. This 
increase would give them five, sorry, a five year approved average change in charge of about 5.3%. The board has been supportive of Springfield through rate increases as this puts them at the second highest behind Northwestern um, who had a catch up year last year. So of the proposed reduction of NPR FPP, which was about two point, well, about $3 million, the rate cut accounts for about $1.2 million, leaving about 1.8 for the hospital to cut from NPR FPP. Um, in addition to this, we are recommending commensurate reductions to expenses, improved timely and accurate submission of financial data, um, presents a revised budget to um, the board and have hospital management provide a strategic plan and to continue our monthly meetings with um, the Mr. Chair and the staff. And here is our suggested motion language. And I will turn it over to Patrick or um, Mr. Chair, if you would like to take it. Do you have anything to add, Patrick? I do not. Back to the board for discussion. So, Caitlin, um, can you go over what the rationale is on reducing the 8.3 to the 6? Um, 8.3 was a bit high. Um, so we wanted to look at where we could cut them, but still keep them in um, a relatively higher range, just to support them as they as they continue in a new as a new organization. So we thought six was um, a, a little better, just like in light of everything going on, and we wanted to make sure that it was affordable for everyone. So as I look at it, Kate, I see that um, with the revision lower on the revenues, um, mm -hmm. even at the 8.3, isn't it a break-even budget? It is. Well, we we're hoping that they would reduce their expenses, but they are at about $900,000, which I believe was about 1.7% of operating margin. Okay. It's the hospital with the lowest days cash on hand and um, everything. This is a very tough one for me. I'd actually hope that um, the con consultants at Springfield had hired that were at the meeting uh, previously were on today because I was going to suggest to Mr. Donahue that he rip up his bill and offer to provide his services for free. I thought it was uh, very disappointing to see somebody um, being paid to do a budget revenue projection and to, to come in and, and try to justify um, numbers that uh, absolutely were not within the realm of reality. Um, so maybe that's why um, we don't have him on the line right now, but I do see that um, Bob Adcock has joined us. I was concerned that I didn't see anybody from Springfield at the beginning and, and uh, Bob, I want nothing but the best for success for Springfield. And you and Kata are really trying hard to make this work. And I'm disappointed that uh, your consultants didn't do a better job for you. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my fellow board members for questions or comments of Kate. So I, this is Tom, I just have a couple of questions. Um, so the reduction, so um, basically level funding Springfield at $50,600,000, um, which is uh, I think what your recommendation is, that's, uh, I can do the math and follow the math, that's a $2,991,000 cut. And so that's basically, and then you reduce the rate, so that, you know, that kind of like, but that, but reducing the rate doesn't reduce expenditures. So they still have to cut uh, $2,991,000 in order to, um, in order to um, meet this uh, budget. And um, there's 941,000 in, in projected OM. And so that would be wiped out leaving um, $2 million uh, for them to find um, uh, in, in their expenses 
um, over the coming years. Is, is that a, an accurate read of what you're saying? Um, we, we want them to, yeah, redu we want them to maintain their margin. Like they need, they need a margin, but yeah, we right. would request that they need to look at their operating expenses. If this budget is, um, if the board moves to approve our recommendation, um, that would be the staff's recommendation that they can, they do cut and look at their operating expenses. Um, so let me, let me go back again, just to understand, I, I understand uh looking at their operating expenses um but i'm trying to figure out in the end where where are they relative to that and i still see that moving to the level funded budget off of um uh you know to mo moving to the 50 million six hundred thousand dollar recommendation where you folks are um still you know leaves them having to find Two million nine hundred ninety-one thousand dollars, and um, they they were projecting um, at the higher budget a nine hundred forty-one thousand margin, and you would like them to preserve that. But in order to preserve that, they need to cut in expenditures two point nine nine million million dollars. I, th I think that's how the math works. That is how the math works. <laughs> we're putting the emphasis back on the hospital to. Be very cautious if their revenues are going to grow from that fiscal year end projection of 45.2 to the budget recommendation we've set at 50.6 to keep a real eye and some pressure on the growth of those expenses because we have new position and traveler cost on their waterfall graph that are contributing a large amount to <clears throat> this expense growth. And yet when we look at the revenue piece, the utilization and volume is not a part of that. So we want them to be very uh, cognizant of the fact that if they need to fill new positions to meet demand, that they give a lot of consideration to that and that we're not hiring ahead of our, uh, they're not hiring ahead of their ability to uh, meet those revenue yeah. demands that are set forth in this budget request. But we absolutely yeah. would like to see them uh, get that positive margin, but um, it's a challenging scenario to say the least. No, I, I I get that, and thank you for that. I I just was trying to figure out how high how how high the bar is, and it's it's a pretty high bar. Um, uh, because even if you uh, you know forget about the nine hundred and forty one thousand dollars in margin, there's that still leaves or and and you and you end up with a margin at zero zero margin. That's still two million dollars in cuts, and uh, um, so I I I get they're between a rock and a hard place, and there's no easy way around it. Um, another question I have is just, a, um, um, I, I know that there is obviously, this is the hospital that I'm sure has a fairly close relationship with the primary care folks um, at the Springfield Medical Care Systems. Um, and I, the, the last financial information I could find on that organization, which, uh, used, which were the, they used to be prior to bankruptcy joined at the hip, um, was a, uh, 2019 IRS 990, where that organization had 33 million, 33.6 million dollars in revenue, and um, they had a basically a three million dollar positive operating margin. And I'm I'm just wondering if the hospital, it, I mean, I, I I know that there was a you know a, a payment of 840 thousand dollars, you know from. Springfield Medical Care Systems to the hospital for services rendered. And I'm just wondering, does anybody have a sense as to whether or not that relationship could be up for negotiate renegotiation? I'm not sure I can answer that, Patrick, unless you do. The staff does not, no. Maybe uh, um, Mr. Adcock, is he there, Adcock? He is here now, Tom. Bob, Sorry, could you I'm answer that? Good morning. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the question. Um, that is something that we would have to discuss and explore. Right, right now, we have spent a fair amount of time separating the organizations over the last 12 months, although we continue to work very closely together so I would have, we would have to 
discuss and clarify exactly what you mean what you mean by that well i, I mean i get it. It, it but my my sense is if the hospital doesn't survive the primary care mission of the springfield medical care systems would be severely threatened so even though that you you know bankruptcy separated you there's still a symbiotic relationship that's pretty important and i'm just wondering given that um uh um, and given that the last uh, irs 990 i saw was 2019 and i haven't seen one for 2020 or for 2021 but um or drafts of those so so i don't know it's a blind spot to me but it would just seem to me that if the hospital is in a really tight squeeze and hanging on by its fingernails it would talk to its 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 uh, partner, its former partner, and its current um, partner, in a way, contractually, to see if a better arrangement or a more balanced arrangement could be achieved. That's just just a question. I'm I'm sure you can't answer it, but just a thought I have. So, Tom, on that point, um, we do have um, Tom Hubner on as well, and I believe he probably could answer that point. And I just want to be clear that. Um, Tom is representing the uh, administration, and Tom's opinion is that uh, the type of cuts that are being asked for here are unrealistic, and given all the cuts that were made in the last year. But Tom, did you want to attempt to answer Tom's question? Tom and Tom? (laughs) Tom, Tom. Tom Hubner, if you're speaking, you're muted. Can you hear me? We can now, Tom. Very okay. lightly, though. Um, the uh, uh, SMCS is doing fine financially. Um, they're in, in good shape. Um, but they are an independent entity. And the contract that Bob has with them is at cost. So um, there is no opportunity for them to just transfer cash for the sake of transferring cash. Um, Uh, It is important that they maintain a strong relationship um, so that uh, they are not competing with each other, but are uh, working in a symbiotic uh, relationship. But there's no real opportunity just to transfer money. Um, And I think, Tom, you're right that the uh, 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 F2AC would be uh, put under greater pressure if the hospital were to fail. Um, and uh, and Kevin is correct that I support the uh, 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 rate increase that Springfield Hospital has uh, requested, um, and I do believe that uh, they need to be careful about expenses, but that um, the key for them is really uh, to uh, rebuild volume over time, and that will uh, is really the uh, most clear avenue for their long-term survival. Thank you for that. Did you have other questions, Tom? I do not. Okay, other board members? Yeah, sure, I'll add a few comments. I mean, first of all, looking at the NPR, um, the reduced NPR to 11.9%, um, against the projection, which is the most relevant thing to look at at this point, um, versus a budget, which which didn't um, materialize, is the highest second to UVM. So, um, again, you know, I, I think the 11.9 won't be achieved, um, but I'm I'm willing to go with the with the hospital budget. And it, again, this is nothing that the board is doing, it's just, it's not showing that they're gonna get that volume that they're expecting with the swing beds and everything else and that they're gonna be higher than any other hospital, you know, other than UVM. And just as an example, if I go to the um, the 2.9 million in commercial that they're expecting to generate on an 8.3% increase, which was built on the negative two on inpatient and 11 on outpatient, um, Last year in total, or their projection right now for commercial is 28 million 182. Um, 
As we all know, the first quarter of their year, October through December, they already have a rate increase in there from last year of 4%. So that's not going to get 8%. I'm sure their consultants and everyone factored that in. Um, and then in the next three quarters, they would get the 8%. So just doing straight math on 2.8 million, that's $2 million. So they're not going to get 2.9 million on commercial rate um, with one quarter at 4% and assuming three quarters at 8.3%. The math they're showing in some of their backup has some of the carriers giving them 15% increases and things like that in their calculation. It, it doesn't work. So that's just an example of where 900,000 of a change will happen without us doing anything. It, it's, it's, the math is not supported. Um, as well as getting a Medicare increase of a million one, they may get that, but that's an over 10% increase on their Medicare base. Um, and they're, so that, that's a pretty high rate there, but I, I know that's based on cost reports. But just to put it in perspective, that's that would be a 10% year-over-year -year increase on Medicare on their current NPR. So the, there probably is some adjustments there. Um, you know, looking at the 8.3% request, uh, agree it's high. Um, but if I look at the past two years per this chart, you know, they had a 4% last year, which was relatively low. Um, they didn't get any incremental COVID money last year. Um, and in, in the scheme of the approved rates, that was relatively uh, low. And in 2020, they had a 0% rate. So, so I do agree that in 18 and 19, they had high rates, but you know, the, the, the 20, 21, 22, what their request is, would not put them in the higher brackets. Um, you know, so I could be in favor of, of the full rate request, really only because of the financial situation that they're in um, and do not want to look back and have, you know, people saying, well, Green Mountain Care Board cut their rate and therefore that's what pushed them, you know, to not succeed in their bankruptcy. Um, I don't see them if they don't cut expenses, I don't see them making it out of this successfully. Um, and again, nothing that we're doing. The, the volume, I don't see how they're going to be the highest hospital, bar second to UVM, um, as a hospital coming out of bankruptcy and getting a 12% increase over their year over year. I, I just, you know, it's really hard to see that math happening. So I think the, the recommendation that we're trying to put forward is, is really saying, the volume is not going to happen. Your calculations for rates still seem to be incorrect, um, which is what I was addressing last time. And you did reduce it, but reduced it pretty modestly, 900,000. And you still, with your request at 18%, were still the second highest of all hospitals with that year-over-year -year request to projection. Um, so I think the message we're trying to send is uh, we really want you to cut those expenses in line with where your revenue is going to come in. Again, not because of anything that we're doing. It's just the trends aren't showing that. Your commercial the rate requests are not supported with the dollars that you're providing. I'd like to see someone tell me how 2.8 million, which is over 10% on all of your commercial, is equal to an 8.3% 8 increase of which again, one quarter of that, you only get 4%. So the, the math doesn't work. Um, so, you know, love to hear the other board's members' perspective on the rate. I know we don't, you know, 8.3% is certainly high, but uh, looking at the past three years combined um, and the situation that they're facing, uh, you know, I could support keeping the 8.3%. Uh, but absolutely agree still, even, even if we keep the 8.3%, that um, I go on record saying that even the volume we're reducing it is aspirational and probably will not occur. And if there are not corresponding expense reductions, um, they'll be out of cash. So thanks. Thank you, Maureen. And, and like you, I, I want to give them a fighting chance. And um, I would say if it wasn't for the pandemic, uh, 
I think I would be saying that they don't deserve more than the 3.5% that was in the guidance. Um, but I think that the state of Vermont has some access issues to deal with and a hospital closing at this point in time, I don't think is in anyone's best interest. Although I would say that this is a, a, a one year thought um, that I'm looking at just to, to give them a chance. And I would think that uh, next year I would have a totally different opinion because I do believe that uh, we can't be protecting small hospitals, period, just, just for the sake of uh, protecting smallness. Well, you have total new new leadership, and you know there there is opportunity in the future under Bob and Kata to try to right this ship. But I, I just want to go back to the anecdotal stories that I've heard from three decades ago when the last hospital in Vermont uh, closed, and what I was told when Rockingham uh, closed that the board had some deep internal thinking and realized that they were all going elsewhere and particularly Dartmouth for their care. And it didn't make uh, sense to uh, continue. And I would say that this can't be done just by Bob and Kata. That's the whole community that has to rally behind the hospital, including fundraising, quite frankly. And this hospital um, does not appear to me at least, to have a sustainable path forward if people don't start using their hometown hospital. And I want to root for them. I want to root for the underdog, but I also don't want to uh, root for inefficiency. And I think that uh, a, a one-year um, look during the times that we're in today is probably justified. Other board members? And maybe I'll, I'll jump in there because I have some similar thoughts, I suppose. And again, I think what we're hearing from all of us is this is a tough one. Um, Springfield hasn't hit their NPR projections for at least the last five budget cycles. Um, utilization has been on the decline for several years, likely related to that rural bypass that Chair Mullen mentioned, shrinking population, and the fact that it is have this proximity to four or five other nearby hospitals. Now it's closed its birthing center, which is going to reduce its revenue potential going forward, right? That's revenue that it's no longer getting. And I suspect that their fixed costs are harder and harder to meet with that declining patient demand. And my worry, as I think people have heard me reference before, is that volumes may reach a level so low that it compromises quality and efficiency, which would certainly be a, prov a problem for community members in that area and certainly doesn't set Springfield up to succeed in a value-based world where hospitals will be held accountable for cost and quality. And I don't think, um, you know, the change in charge increases of 8.3% are not going to solve the underlying structural problem there, particularly given their payer mix. So it, with direct relationship to what Chair Mullen was just saying, I think our budget order should somehow encourage the new leadership in partnership with their board of trustees to take a closer look at possible affiliations of shared service agreements, a reoptimization of service mix in preparation for that value-based world. I would love, this is an aside, but I would love to see some out-of-the-box thinking. We have an acute and dangerous shortage of mental health capacity in the state. Springfield has excess bed capacity. Could Springfield, for example, leverage its experience and become a center of excellence for inpatient mental health in the state, right? Maybe. Could they fill an incredible need we have for geriatric psych, for example? I don't pretend to know the answers, but I know that Springfield's current trajectory does not seem sustainable and even more worrisome as we move into a value-based world. So um, I think for me, I'm, I'm with Maureen on some of the math and uh, the aspirational nature of the budget. To me, the NPR growth, even in the revised budget, is still overly optimistic in my mind. And I'm, I'm extremely worried about the fact that Springfield really didn't adjust expenses to go align with their reduction in the NPR. So now the result is just a reduced margin, right? They had an original margin projection of 3.4. Now it's 1.7. If they hit that NPR target, which I think many of us are doubting, um, and the revised days cash on hand projection of 11 days to me is deeply troubling. So at the end of the day where I sit, actually I don't have a lot of confidence in voting for either certainly not the original. I don't even have confidence in voting for the revised budget without more work from Springfield. 
Um, I honestly believe Springfield has to go back to the drawing board in some ways. So how do we accomplish that? Uh, I think it's possible that we could do what we did with Copley in fiscal year 17, I think, when we had some questions about their budget and it was back and forth. And at the end of the day, we weren't prepared to approve the budget as submitted um, without some redo. I think what we did with Copley was we approved the budget but asked them to come back. So I think, or some modified version of the budget and ask them to come back. So one way we could achieve this is approve Springfield's budget, perhaps with a temporarily modified NPR growth, expense growth, change in charge, along with a condition that Springfield's come back with a revised budget. I don't know what the date might be, October 15th, something like that, November 1st. Um, I think that budget order that we would approve now would have to identify specific ways that they would you know, uh, have to come back, you know, some guidelines, um, maybe in terms of what a margin expectation is or reduction in expenses. Alternatively, I think possibly, and I guess we'd have to ask legal here, but could we use Act 91 authority to approve nothing today, but simply extend the, de the, the deadline for resubmission, provide those guard mails, such as uh, a recommended NPR growth rate for Springfield, the margin of change in charge, and then using that Act 91 authority to extend the deadline, I think we would have to agree that, um, you know, we were meeting the Act 91. This is the COVID allowance that allows us to adjust our, our, our processes because of the COVID situation that we're in. So we'd have to agree that extending the deadline is necessary to, and I think this is a direct quote, to prioritize and maximize direct patient care, safeguard the stability of healthcare providers and allow for orderly regulatory processes. So if we agreed that that was true, we might be able to just extend the deadline and send them back to the drawing board. So that's kind of where my head is at, is that I don't feel confident enough in approving anything right now, because I don't really know if we if we force those expense reductions, I don't even know where they're coming from. I don't know what the consequences are. I don't feel confident in the revenue projections, and I, I'm concerned about their day's cash on hand and the margin that we leave them with. So I, I need to know more before I could approve it. Kate, a point that Jessica made um, reminds me, did we get an attestation from the board chair in Springfield? Yes, we did. Uh, yep, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, we did. Thank you. Other board members? So I'll chime in since I haven't talked yet. Um, this is a tough one. Um, I think, so I, I think I, you know, I'm part of what's tough for me is similar to Jess. I just feel like there's been a lot of uh, revisions and changes kind of at the last minute without a lot of time um, to really understand them and digest them, at least for me. Um, so I like the idea, and I think it is included in um, Caitlin and in, in the staff recommendations. Um, Caitlin, can you go to that slide, your recommendations, or whoever's driving, could you please go to the recommendation slide? Um, so my question was that in the additional recommendations, the staff did include presentation of a revised budget and a strategic plan, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit more in terms of what you had in mind with that. I believe in Patrick can correct me if and Lori can correct me if I'm wrong, but we were trying to kind of mirror um, what was done with Copley a few years ago, um, just to have them, you know, take a second look and come in with a revised budget, but with like the guardrail set up that the board felt comfortable with. Yeah, and I can I, add to that. Um, <clears throat> also, as part of that um, management coming in, we would want the board chair to be involved in that discussion uh, so that this board, the Green Mountain Care Board, can have a clearer understanding of where management and the board see this hospital going um, to some of the points that have been made thus far. We don't feel we have a clear understanding of that as they've emerged from bankruptcy. And the farther and farther away we get from that um, emergence from bankruptcy, the more important it's going to be for us as regulators to understand what is the future of this hospital and with new leadership, welcome some of those ideas that board member Holmes made around perhaps getting creative with what this organization can be um, to be part of the Vermont uh, provider network in the future. 
Thank you. Um, so I think for me, um, that's a key piece, uh, having a revised budget presentation at some point. And again, I don't know what the appropriate timing would be, but um, at some point to consider. I think what I would probably be more comfortable with, given the financial situation um, and the revised, particularly the revised days cash on hand, would be to approve something now. Um, and I think where I am with the understanding that we get more information and and basically look at a revised budget soon. But the reason why that feels important to me is because of the change in charge and sort of the time between uh, when that would get approved and when it actually flows through the payer negotiations and into um, becoming reality. Um, because I agree with what everybody else has said. I, I have a hard time even with the increase in swing beds and the adult day, seeing how the volumes are going to come back that quickly. Maybe because of, to, to Kevin's point, uh, the access issues in other areas, although you know the access issues seem to be for other types of services, more uh, tertiary care type services that don't really seem like necessarily would benefit this hospital. Um, and normally I would agree with staff that the 8.3 is high, but given the financial situation, the pandemic and everything else that everyone else has talked about, I think I am comfortable with approving the 8.3% um, for now. And, uh, and I, it, or just, I guess I, maybe that adds too much doubt. I guess I would say I'm comfortable with the 8.3%. Overall, I, I just feel uncomfortable with the other pieces. Um, and so what I would probably do is go with the staff recommendation for now and then um, have the revised budget come in so that we can look at, um, take a deeper look. I do agree that it's important for us to have a better understanding of what the future vision is for the hospital. And to, you know, Bob is, is brand new and I'm really sympathetic for to Bob and Kata's situation um, coming in and trying to really uh, turn the hospital around. And But I think that vision needs, in my mind, needs to be creative for a lot of the points that Kevin, that Kevin and Jess and Maureen and Tom all raised. Um, I, I do have concerns that given that corner of the state has a lot of hospitals and a lot of small hospitals and without some real creativity, um, the community will end up, uh, you know, with a failed hospital, which may not be the best thing for that community, given its demographic and the challenges that I think many residents in Springfield would have uh, traveling. So, um, so that's I think where I'm at. Um, Kevin, I did have a question for you. You said you would give them a chance on the NPR with the 3.5, and so are you saying that you? don't agree with the zero, you would go with a 3.5? No, what I had said, Robin, was that if it wasn't for the circumstances that we were in, I wouldn't do the change of charge higher than the 3.5. Oh, 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 oh. I, okay, I thank you. To do with the NPR. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood. I just wanted to clarify. And to be quite frank, even if um, we were to reduce the NPR and they exceeded it, I think that uh, there, there would... Uh, unlikely be enforcement given the type of unpredictable year this is. So um, I'm just not that worked up over the NPR. Yeah. I think it's unrealistic what they presented without a doubt. Okay, thank you. Um, so those were my thoughts and, and where I'm at. Other board members? Does anyone have anything additional to say? Well, I can just kind of sum up where I'm at. Um, I'm kind of aligned where where Maureen was. Um, I, I worry a little bit about the board getting too close to this um, and uh, basically absorbing energy that uh, might exist in, in the hospital to uh, right their ship um, and also give uh, create an expectation 
in the community that the Green Mountain Care Board is going to uh, assure the survival of, of Springfield Hospital rather than you know, the community knowing that uh, they have a task before them. So I, ju I, I would just, you know, I, I think, you know, necessity is um, very prevalent here. And um, I trust that the hospital folks will do everything they can to uh, right their ship. Um, and I, so I, I think that per pressure is, is enough, you know, I, I wouldn't want to overlay that pressure with a lot of process associated with keeping the Green Mountain Care Board informed. I think the monthly meetings with the chair and the staff are sufficient. Um, and um, but it, they shouldn't be structured, you know, that that we are going to provide the path forward. It's just that we want to be informed and and, and know what's going on. But I, I think um, the pressure is there on the management of the hospital to solve the problem and um, and to work with the community to solve the problem. And I think that's where their focus should be. But I, I can support the 8.3%. Other board members have any follow-up comments? Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, I, I think the points that Jess brought up and, and Robin as well about really making sure that there's a presentation and, you know, for, for the board recommendation of the staff that we see that revised presentation, that we see the strategic plan, um, you know, I do think at least getting the change in charge and aligning on that, um, you know, needs to be put in place so that they can be planning there. And, you know, I think on the NPR um, recommendations and where we're coming at is is just the convincing um, you know, us that, that that was achievable, that you had in here and, and that was not supported. And, you know, whether or not they can even get to the the new revised number, which is still up 11%, and as I said, I think is aspirational. Um, but I think we need to give them time to work, really work through that. Um, and then corresponding, you know, they would have to put in expense reductions or they'll be out of cash. So I think we're just trying to prevent what what we, you know, the train we see coming down the road. And um, you know, I, I think whether it's conditional and we could do that, I like Jess's points there about, you know, approving something now so that they can move forward and then having, you know, a specific deadline of when they're going to come back with, um, you know, with the materials to support the top line and the cuts and expenses and, and having that review time. So I think that really needs to be in the conditions, um, whether that's October 15th, um, and the ability, you know, I guess with the legal, having legal's input on the ability to make those adjustments um, down the road or, you know, again, approve or bypass the full approval, um, you know, per some of the acts that we could do um, until we have something that the board feels comfortable with. So I guess I'm flexible to, to how we do something here. I think we should put in something for change in charge. Um, you know, again, top line, I think is aspirational, even with the, re you know, reduction that we're requesting. Um, and I'd like to give the hospital time to really come through with uh, their support for reduced budget and reduced expenses. So thanks, Maureen. And I just want to uh, say that uh, I think Tom made some uh, great points um, as well in that um, I don't know. We we sent out a lot of questions to Springfield. They answered them. We don't agree with their answers. Um, and so I'm not sure that if we ask them to come back in one month's time, if the, the plan is going to be any different, because it's not giving them the time to really flesh something out. Um, so I would worry that if we um, ask them to represent their budget, in October that we're being unrealistic ourselves. And I think uh, you have to give Mr. Adcock a chance um, at uh, writing this ship. I do think that it would be helpful if um, their board chair came before us so that we 
could at least have some assurances that the board and the community are behind the management team and um, are doing all that they can to uh, make this this a success. But I, I just worry that uh, if we put too many conditions on it, they're not going to be doing what we want them to do at the hospital. So trying to figure out what that uh, those right conditions are um, is somewhat tricky. And I know that Robin is uh, probably stressing out right now, trying to figure out how to make a motion in this situation. But I know that uh, she will make a great one when she does. <laughs> and uh, we'll go from there. So I think, uh, I mean, I, so I think what I would do is start with the conditions and then do the change in charge and NPR FPP last, even though I think we're probably closer on those two things. But I think the conditions is where I'm hearing we may have some differences of opinion. So let me try, um, and particularly around the revised budget. Um, so, so I think this is going to take a few motions maybe to kind of sort that out if that works for you, Kevin. It does, Robin. Whatever motion you make, if it's seconded, it's appropriate. <laughs> oh, I, okay. So I'll go ahead and make a motion so that you can get to public comment unless you wanted to do that first. No, I wanted to get a motion first and then I wanted to go to public comment. Okay. So uh, I think we should start with um, the budget revision. And I, and I don't disagree with Tom. I don't want to load on the work so that, um, you know, so that the hospital can't focus on what they need to focus on. I just think that um, I'm also uncomfortable approving something that I I just don't see how it's possible. So that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm going to um, move that we uh, approve, um, move that, at, so I'm going to move that as part of our uh, budget order for Springfield Hospital that we require a presentation of a revised budget to the board by the hospital leadership, including a representative from their board of directors or board of trustees um, at a date to be negotiated between the board chair and the hospital, um, which will include justification for NPR um, and expenses as well as strategic vision for the hospital. Is and there a second? Long. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Can I make a friendly amendment? That will Depends be up to Rob. Go ahead and make the suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that there should be a no later than date you know, so negotiation between staff and the hospital, but a no later than some date that they would come before us. I'm fine with that. I just don't like to Kevin's point. I just don't know what the date should be. That's why I punted, quite frankly. But maybe no later than. If you if you give them 90 days from now, it'd probably be OK. That's fine by me. Okay, so that would be no later than, well, quite frankly, it's going to, just thinking about our schedule, I think getting, so the, this is for the revised submission, not necessarily the hearing. So what if we said no later than um, January 1st? Oh, January. November. Yeah, we're I was going to say January 1st because it's almost October, November, no, December. Yeah. Does the seconder agree with the friendly amendment? Yes. Oh, sorry. No, I'm the <laughs> second. Um, my concern with the January 1st date is you're already through the first quarter of their the year by the time you get something. But, you know, not sure how quickly they would be able to do something. But this is urgent um, and, you know, not, not how much change we'll be able to do after, 
you know, one quarter is already done. So, you know, understanding time constraints and wanting to give them the ability to put something together, but uh, I, I think that may be too long. Um, you know, so I would, I would prefer to put something in earlier and, you know, have them still work with the staff to see if that's achievable. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the group for other reasons. Well, you'd have to agree to the friendly amendment, Maureen. Otherwise, it's it, it would have to be uh, uh, a motion to amend. But does anyone else have those concerns on the date? Yeah, I think I do. I think this is, should be a priority of Springfield to, to come back and, and really present a workable action plan to generate a, a real margin. And, and I think that should be a priority. So I would like to see that happen before January 1st, the more I think about it. Yeah, so what about November 1st? I mean, 45 days. I mean, you know, this this is make or break, right? And if, if a quarter is already down in the road and if, if what we're saying is what we believe is going to be a lower top line, you know, there'll already be a quarter into that um, and a quarter into the additional losses at that point. They, they could be out of cash <laughs> by November by 1st. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm November fine with November 1st. 1st. I'm okay with November 1st. I, I just think it's uh, a little bit unrealistic, November 1st. If you went November 15th, it might be doable. I mean, I'm, I'm okay to go November 15th, but 60 days is a long time to to wait and, and be doing the budget. Um, but let's go with November 15th for, for a compromise. And if they can do it earlier, then, then it could be... Again, November. this is the, the tail end, and I'll work it out with... Uh, um, Mr. Adcock on uh, when he believes it's uh, um, appropriate to have uh, representation from his board and his leadership team to come in. Um, it's it's the uh, end date. It's not uh, when it might actually occur. So I'm good with that. And yeah, I, I will stress no later than sooner is better. So yeah, seconder agrees. <laughs> Okay, so with that, I did see uh, Ham Davis had his hand up. Thanks, Kevin. I have a question, a fact question and a comment. Um, the, the fact question is, I understood that uh, Springfield Hospital got as much as $10 million from the from AHS under the federal COVID money. Is that wrong? Patrick, do you have that uh, um, spreadsheet with you by any chance? Not offhand, I don't, but I do believe they received $10 million from the state of Vermont. I believe that number is accurate. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, the, uh, and, and that, that money is, that was, that's one time money that's going to have to be replaced uh, in their run rate. My comment is, I think that's right, uh, Patrick, um, but thank you for that. Here's, here's my comment. It's the reality is we've got 14 and a half hospitals in this state, okay, for 600,000 people. And it's hard for me to imagine how you could have any more evidence, okay, that Springfield Hospital is a failed business model. Just leaning on them and saying they've got to go to the community and they've got to get more support and so forth. Here's a question I would ask Kevin. Um, this is kind of a long comment, but I'll keep it as short as I can. You say the community has got to support them. The community is about a 29-minute ride from a from a an academic uh, medical center with a level one trauma center. If what you want to do, if what the community you, you mean the community community should do is to start taking their new hips and their new re hip replacements to Springfield instead of the Dartmouth, that's a pretty risky thing. Would you that would you do that with your knees? The reality is that these guys don't have the volume to do this. They don't begin to have the they don't begin to have the infrastructure. You yourselves, it it would be hard to imagine if you took this five member board and put them in court and let them pile up all the evidence that this business model doesn't work at all. That that decision would be a slam dunk. If you can't do if you can't take something as obvious as Springfield then I don't believe this board's gonna have any credibility to get the ultimate job done, which is to get this whole system sustainable to go into the next decade, okay? 
um, without being if you can't solve a, if you can't figure this out if this is an, if this is, if, if this is not enough evidence if there's not enough information to tell you that this business model doesn't work what would it take that's my question so ham i think you directed it at me and i'll answer it that uh, um i tend to agree with you and the um reality is though that we're in the middle of a pandemic the taxpayers of the state of vermont have invested a lot of money in trying to give them an opportunity to make it go and uh, I think that uh, I'm not looking for them to take on um, things that are, are uh, the type of uh, higher level care that you're suggesting. But what I am hearing him is a lot of anecdotal stories of things that could and should be done in a community um, people are, are going elsewhere for, such as mammography and colonoscopy and things like that. And so that's my comments to the community are based on if you want a local emergency room and you want a hospital to be sustainable into the future, then your preventive care really should be with that institution. And if you're not going to take your preventive care and have faith in your own local institution, then don't expect us or the state of Vermont to keep it uh, going. Quite frankly, my recommendation would be to the state not to put another dime into uh, Springfield. Oh. I think that the state has done bent over backwards to do everything that it can to give them an opportunity. And this is really the, the last opportunity. Ham? Thanks, thanks for that, Kevin. I think he, here's a way to get, I, I, I understand exactly what you're getting at, but here's what I really think is going on, but this, is the kind of question that you've built a whole staff to determine. Look at what's going on in this hospital. Are they ain't going to be able to keep going? Are they going to be able to keep their doors open with doing the kind of care that you've suggested that is totally easy to do at a local level? Or is what they are really depending on is fancy orthopedics just to get enough money in the door? I asked the previous chairman uh, the when I forget his name. You'll remember his name. Uh, he was the guy that came in from Quorum. I asked him, uh, uh, very, uh, I'm sure people have forgotten, but I asked him, uh, why do you have to do hip replacements and, new re and knee replacements? And he was just, he didn't even know how to answer the question. It was inconceivable to him. But if you ever looked at New York, okay, where E-Town Hospital is a 25-bed hospital with a 10-year um, positive margin and and in the black every step of the way they've done that without without um without any surgery at all here's the thing and there's a second question that's been raised here i'd just like to mention i'll shut up the one of the huge questions here is how much money you don't regulate fqhc's but who's taking care who's going to send any more money to make sure that primary care is there if somebody doesn't get a, needs a knee replacement or a hip replacement and they don't get it at Springfield, it's a half an hour ride on the terrible road of I-91. Okay, but if they don't have primary care, then you have a real, real horror show. And my question is this, how much support has, has the system provided the primary care things like FQHCs in this system? So there were significant rural dollars that came in the initial rounds from the federal government that did help, um, for example, the FQHC in Springfield. And so um, the community is fortunate that they they do have what appears to be uh, a healthy FQHC at this time. And um, am I answering your question, Ham, or or you you you've helped me. One other thing that truth is I'm you know I'm writing a book on this and I, one of the things I've been trying to track in fact I spent Saturday down at yours and your FQHC it's hot I can just tell you your your FQHC the biggest one in the state fit 40,000 people in it they think they need more money um uh that that's what they think and and so primary care even if they're getting some money they need they don't they're not getting enough money they're not getting enough support. So all I'm saying is, ask this question. 
take the stuff, make a judgment. I mean, you have policy people, not just money people. Make a judgment about whether the order of services you've got, you've got, uh, you, you've got this whole consultant thing coming in. Supposed to be was supposed to be in February. Okay, these the, the, the service lines that they're delivering make sense with a unit cost that makes any sense at all and makes any sense medically in the quality sense. Because the volume's too low. That's what I, 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 don't, I don't know who's right here, but, but you've got a whole staff here. Take a look. I mean, ask the staff. We, look into this budget. All you'd have to do is call them up. Ask them, but uh, how much of this stuff that they could, that is, that people are going, starting to drive, the people in Springfield are starting to drive right by their own hospital for stuff like hip and knee replacements to go to Dartmouth. And if I was there, I would too. Take a look. What 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 is the ser what is the service line mix? You guys got five people here with all kinds of expertise. What you really need to know is what is the service mix? Does the service mix here in this hospital make medical and financial sense? If it does, then it's worth trying to save. If it doesn't, it isn't. Thank you, Ham. Other members of the public. If not, the motion, oh, Steve Gordon. Yeah, I'm trying to get, uh, can you guys hear me? We can, Kevin. Steve. Yep. So just I want to make a, a couple of points. Um, one is uh, Brattleboro has been working with Springfield. We uh, are working actually, myself and Bob, on what else, what other specialties uh, we can help with Springfield. As you know, several years ago when um, the birthing center of Springfield uh, closed, uh, we established um, uh, an OB practice uh, so there wouldn't be an OB desert um, up there. And we're going to look at other opportunities uh, to work with Springfield. So I don't want you to think that, you know, Springfield is look is in a vacuum right now. Um, Bob and I are having those uh, dialogues and trying to identify how we can help from a uh, Brattleboro standpoint, even though we're about 45 minutes away. The, the other point I want to make, because I've heard – Jessica, as well as the staff, talk about the loss of revenue um, when birthing center closed down. And no one should think that there's any money to be made in OB in this state, especially um, those of us that have served a uh, Medicaid population. So they might have lost revenue uh, by dropping that program, but they also, it was a very significant loss leader like it is in Brattleboro and most of the other small hospitals where you don't have a high commercial payer. So there's a misconception out there that OB is a moneymaker. And I got to tell you, it is not. I've talked about it in our presentations. And it's probably losing us about $4 million, but it's part of our mission uh, here. And if we didn't do it down in Brattleboro, you'd have a very significant problem in an OB desert in south, uh, southeastern Vermont. So those are the two points I, I want to make, and I'll sign off. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Just to uh, uh, be clear that the point that was being made is that um, because of um, that move, which makes sense financially, no one. you're right, no one is making money on OBGYN, but the point was that it's going to that's a reduction to the NPR and to think that you can um, miraculously find, um, you know, revenue coming in um, that's going to replace that in a profitable area of your hospital um, is unrealistic. And I think that's the point that several board members made. Nobody was trying to make the point that they should not have um, um, done what was done, because the reality is even with you doing all the services, you are still losing money. And I thank you for what you're doing there, because um, you're right. If if you weren't doing it, it would go to a higher cost um, location for uh, delivery. So um, we appreciate that, Steve. But I just don't think that was the point that anyone was trying to make. Mr. Chair, yeah. if I, may, um, I just want to reiterate your point um, because I was going to disrespectfully or sorry, respectfully disagree with Mr. Gordon's perspective. That was not where we were taking that discussion. What we were highlighting was exactly what you said. This is a different organization now. 
than it was in years past. And that's why we had a very difficult time from a revenue perspective and expense perspective, understanding uh, where that organization's 22 budget was um, going as presented to us. Yeah. Other so public comments? Was, Kevin, can I just Go say ahead, one? Yeah. Since my name was mentioned in that, um, I just think there is, we, we do understand there's a difference between revenue and profit. And so we were all referencing the revenue implications of the closure of the of the birthing center, not the profit implications of the closing of the birthing center and in the projections for NPR. So I think we've all reiterated that, <laughs> you know, beat a dead horse, but we understand that birthing centers are not money makers. And yet we believe strongly in uh, um, encouraging uh, new babies because um, Vermont needs all the help that it can get with its population. So with that, um, Robin, I'm going to uh, truncate your motion, but your motion was to require uh, a presentation of a revised budget. Um, and in that uh, presentation, including a representative from the Springfield Board, um, at a date to be negotiated between uh, myself and uh, Mr. Adcock to be no later than November 15th, 2021. Did I truncate that okay? Yes. Okay. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those, those opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was a unanimous uh, motion. Robin, I'll call on you again. Okay, so I move that we approve Springfield Hospital's budget subject to the, con the budget condition of a revision that was just voted on with an NPR FPP growth of 0% from the fiscal year 21 budget and a 8.3% change in charge, continuing the monthly meetings between the chair and staff with the hospital, um, requesting improved timely and accurate submission of financial and financial data. Is there a second? Second. Is there board discussion? I'll just chime in and say I did leave out the reduction to expenses because I thought that that would be something that would be addressed in the revised budget, but that I just wanted to point that out in case others disagree with that. Thank you, Robin. Other discussion from the board? If not, we'll open it up for um, public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? Hearing none, um, those in favor of the motion before us, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. So I believe that I have to do a roll call and um, Russ McCracken, are you on? Uh, I am Mr. Chair. So I will take the roll in alphabetical order. Uh, Member Holmes? No. Member Lunge? Yes. Uh, Chair Mullen? Yes. Uh, Member Pelham? Yes. And Member Yusufer? Yes. Thank you. And, and Bob, we uh, wish you well, and uh, I look forward to uh, our conversations moving forward. Thank you, Kevin. With that, Patrick, I'm going to throw it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We are going to move on to the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, <clears throat> uh, currently, with the projection received for this budget, they are coming in 8.5% under their FY21 budget of $1.415 billion, $1 billion, which means their projection is just shy of $1.3 billion. 
their fiscal year 22 request is 1.5 billion, which is about $204 million over the projection and about $84 million over their FY21 budget, which results in a 6% budget to budget variance and a 15.8% uh, FY22 budget to FY21 projection variance. Uh, they are looking for just over 7% in a charge master increase, which is largely allocated to commercial and Medicare payers. Um, as you can see from the graph below here, as we trend 3.5% forward from the pre-pandemic year of 2019, uh, they would be at about 1.42 billion dollars, just to put in context where they are uh, currently at, uh, projecting for fiscal year in 2021, and where they are hoping to achieve uh, their FY22 budget at 1.5 billion. The leadership's justification was volume surge, higher acuity of patients, and capacity. These are themes that. Uh, we have heard from almost all hospitals uh, throughout this process. They need these budgets to make staffing and capital investments to improve patient access. They are, as with every other hospital in the state, um, succumbing to inflationary pressures on the operating expense side of their income statement. They are forecasting demographic changes and challenges uh, coming out of the pandemic and the years ahead. Uh, they want to be sustainable and affordable. They're stressing positive margins. Uh, and again, their rate of 7.05% is for incremental inflation only. And I will highlight with the provider transfers that were already approved, the organic budget to budget growth of this hospital is 6.34%. <clears throat> Bridging their budgets or reconciling from year to year, we can see um, some NPR suppressing activity from reimbursement and payer mix of 22.2 million. Uh, utilization reduction of 6.6 .6, uh, provider acquisitions. That's that $4.5 million figure uh, and bad debt and free care. <clears throat> On the other end, contributing to the growth of their budget is COVID testing revenues. Uh, the rate impact of all those payers combined at 42.6 million. And then the uh, line item they've identified as rate difference, which I hope I'm saying this uh, accurately is their uh, reconciliation from past budget bases due to the um, integration of EPIC and then the cyber incident, incident that occurred last year that have impacted their last two uh, fiscal budgets and that this is kind of a recapture of revenues that perhaps have not uh, been able to be accurately captured in the past, thus justifying that growth to the 1.5 billion. No surprises on the operating expense side. Inflation uh, at just over 41 million is leading the pack uh, and uh, largely uh, outstrips even new staff positions at 19.6 million, other at 14.1, and wages and compensations for non MDs of over $12 million. Uh, purchase services at 7.2 <clears throat> and fringe benefits at 5.3, and on they go um, in descending order right to left. Uh, as we all know from uh, items discussed, the medical center had a uh, underperforming first quarter. Uh, as you can see, the revenues there are just over 282 million and an operating margin uh, in the red at 34.7 million. Uh, the second quarter saw a rebound for them in January to March as the vaccines became more prominent in the state, and people's confidence returned as it did with several hospitals. The margin there does not reflect that return of confidence and um, higher volumes. The, the majority of that $69 million is about $39 million that was put on the books um, that the organization was bypassed uh, in 2020. And they had received that money in the first quarter, somewhere around the first quarter, um, but because of the cyber incident and the impact on financials, uh, they were not able to book that with confidence until Q2. So that spike you see from Q1 up to Q2 is largely driven by those provider relief funds that came in uh, from the federal government. And we can see in, in Q3, the numbers really begin to grow. That's the um, best performing quarter to date. And then Q4 projections are forecasting a slight reduction over Q3 at just under $340 million. And we can see positive operating margins are projected to finish out the year. Again, the impact of the provider transfers, this is nothing that we have to address today because it's already been done. For anyone who needs access to that information, the links are here at the bottom of the page and, and 
the uh, board presentation and the approved minutes from that meeting, but you can see the overall net revenue and operating expense increases. Just to recap, these were services that are physically offered at the Central Vermont Medical Center campus. That has not changed. Uh, what has changed is the tax identification number under which um, these services are billed. That is now under Central Vermont, whereas before it was under the UVM Medical Center. So the UVM Medical Center used to capture those revenues. Now Central Vermont is capturing those revenues and the uh, corresponding expenses that go with them. So um, from a care perspective, nothing here has changed. This is an accounting um, item that um, has been made by the UVM Health Network to realign those revenues and expenses. <clears throat> Here's the history of the UVM Medical Center. Um, they did outperform budget over several years, FY 2020 being one of the outliers as well as 2021. Um, due to all of the circumstances that we have discussed, and you can see here that 2022 budget, they are looking to uh, regain some of that lost ground um, as things uh, hopefully stabilize for the healthcare system in Vermont. And we have a history here of margins that um, were very, very high in 16 and 17 and have been on the decline, uh, bottoming out in FY 2020. And we can see here in 2021 that the projected year end margin just shy of 53 million. And again, that is somewhat inflated by the 39 or so million dollars that they've received uh, and were bypassed for last year. If we're to take that out, that margin is significantly reduced, but FY 2020s is significantly improved if they were to align in the fiscal years by which they should have received that money. And then FY22 budget, uh, the medical center is looking to get to a 3% margin or just over $51 million. The charge breakdown, um, overall NPR impact is 42.6 million. Uh, they have identified <laughs> the commercial component of 1% to be 5.6, Medicare to be 3.5 and Medicaid uh, relatively immaterial at 785,000. They will apply the 7.05 across inpatient, outpatient, and professional services equitably. You can see the breakdown of the NPR impact. So that $42.6 million is broken down into 39 and a half. Uh, no change to Medicaid, $4.2 million allocation from Medicare and negative $1.1 million from self-pay other. The overall budget to budget request is just shy of 85 million and change in charge uh, drives about 42.6 of that. <clears throat> Five-year average, they've been approved at 2.3% for uh, uh, increases to their charge master, but they also adopted the commercial effective rate over several years um, up to 2021 where they were approved at 3% by the Green Mountain Care Board. This is a hospital that we know has a positive payer mix. They are in, um, demographically speaking, one of the youngest counties, if not the youngest county uh, in the state. It's also the most populous county, as we know, um, which helps drive some of those revenues that we see at um, UVM Medical Center. They capture about 65% of their <laughs> gross uh, revenues down to their net and on average across the hospital, it's about 43% with government payers coming in at 30% and slightly under that. Uh, minor payer mix change from projection to budget, 2% uh, on commercial, and that's being allocated for 1% increases to Medicare and Medicaid respectively. So I'll start here uh, with the change in charge because we are uh, recommending a 1% reduction to 6.05%, which would align with the 6% that they had received last year from the Green Mountain Care Board. This would effectively reduce MPR of five points to five point, or by $5.6 million. Um, we are asking you to approve the NPR growth as submitted with the provider transfers. Uh, and we, we do believe that this is a hospital that can attain uh, that $1.5 billion MPR figure. Um, and a major reason for that is we've heard from hospitals across the state about the higher acuity of patients that are coming in, the volume resurgence that they're seeing, and this hospital is no different. But as the state's sole tertiary care hospital, when a higher level of care is required, um, there are a few places to go, and this is one of them. So if the acuity uh, higher acuity is going to continue. We can see that volume resurgence occurring over a longer period of time at this hospital, um, simply for the fact that it is what it is. 
and they provide levels of care that other hospitals cannot. Uh, we also <clears throat> believe overall financially that investments do need to be made uh, to the infrastructure and in staffing uh, to help um, see this hospital through the next 12 months or so uh, as far as an operational uh, perspective is concerned. Um, so a couple of things can happen here. If the NPR is reduced by 5.6 and th they do not recapture that from NPR, it would fall to the bottom line as presented, which would shrink their margin from 3% to 2.7. I will point out in some of the materials that leadership provided us, um, their range according to their A rating across the various bond companies is a 1.5% to 2.8% operating margin to help maintain as part of one of the um, risk-based qualifiers for maintaining that A rating. So the 2.7%, if things were to play out that way, would still be within that range. Um, so we would be, we would feel good about the fact that we did take into consideration their operating margin when proposing this. Um, but the reason we're looking at a cut here is this is a hospital that has uh, <clears throat> many, many resources. It has um, the demographics uh, at their back and a favorable com commercial payer mix to match that. And really we have not gone above six until the Springfield decision just now. So we really feel that with all of the advantages that the UVM Medical Center has, we would make that slight reduction, but still supporting them in a significant way with back-to-back 6% -back increases year to year. So we do feel that from that perspective, um, the board is supporting the hospital financially. We also recognize that this is an organization that's been a leader in COVID response. It's been a leader in payment reform. And from the staff's perspective, we would really like to see them become a leader in cost reduction. Um, we've heard anecdotally that um, those reductions are being worked on as investments are made in Epic, Premier Connect, Workday, et cetera. We would really like to see on paper some figures coming in that show that those efforts are returning uh, an investment to this organization and to the health network in general. Um, so we think that within this rate reduction that they can find $5.6 million, maybe not in the first couple months of the fiscal year, but towards the end of the fiscal year as those programs begin to return those investments, especially with Epic. Now, they will be on Epic two years as of this November. So uh, we are hoping that this reduction can be met with offsetting operating expenses to help maintain that 3% margin that they're looking for. So with that, we'll turn it back over to the board for discussion on the UVM Medical Center. Thank you, Patrick. I'm gonna open it up to the board for comments or questions. Tom? Hey, you're forcing me to go first. Um, well, your, your square lit up blue, so I thought you were trying to say something. No, I mean, I have something to say, but I wasn't sure I could say. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you go, because I, um, let me wait to talk about what I want to talk about after we, you know, people have responded to specifically to the slides that um, Patrick just presented. Because I, I, I have a, a, a tangent that I do want to spend some time on, but I don't want to be first. Okay. Other, other board members. Maureen, your your lips are moving, but we're not hearing anything. So we're we're still not hearing anything, Maureen. So maybe we'll uh, go to a, another board member, and maybe you'll have to sign off and come back in. Other board members? Is anybody hearing me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we are hearing you. <laughs> so I can go ahead. Um, you know, I think this year, uh, it's not like UVM is ever that easy, but I think they're also particularly tough this year because of the access to care issues. Um, I, I think that 
because for me, because of the access to care issues and really a hope that they will uh, be able to work on the various issues that are underlying that um, over this next year, I would be comfortable approving the NPR increase because it gives room for the pent up demand. It gives room for um, those access issues to be uh, addressed. Um, the change in charge is a harder piece. Um, their financial situation is great um, now, which is terrific. Um, but I do, I really do worry about their affordability for Vermonters. Um, and so I'm hoping other folks will have, uh, will share their thoughts on the change in charge. Um, because I'm I'm just not quite comfortable with 6%. I, I think that may still be too high in terms of affordability, um, but I'm open to hearing other people's perspectives. I'm not, I haven't made a final decision. Um, and then I would also um, af at some point be interested to have the discussion about slide 125, but that doesn't have to be right this second either. Quite frankly, I think that just like we did uh, in the last uh, situation, it would be better to take that on as a separate discussion. And I think we ought to go to that first. So I think that Dr. Brumstead laid out a very good letter to us. Um, and I think that uh, the the real thing now is to um, make sure that uh, we're being regularly updated on the progress that is being made. And so um, I would hope that um, one of the conditions would be that we have some type of regular reporting similar to the reporting on the inpatient psych beds to occur on the progress that is being made by the UVM leadership team, preferably in person, unless there's um, some valid reason not to. Um, and when I say in person, it could be through teams, but I, I, I'm i saying rather than in writing, I think it's helpful for all Vermont to um, be made aware in an open and transparent process, the progress that is being made on the uh, access issues. So to me, this is um, probably the most important condition of anything that we place on uh, this budget is making sure that we continue the conversation with UVM to uh, make sure that progress is being made. Russ, were you gonna present this slide? Yeah, this, this, is, uh, this is Russ. Shall I walk through this slide? That would be helpful. Yeah. So um, at the last deliberation, uh, Chair Mullen, you requested specific ideas from the team regarding a budget order condition. Um, I think as you, you just alluded to, it is important that we um, include a reference here to the letter from Dr. Brumstead on September 7th that identifies the actions that the UVM Health Network hospitals have taken and are taking um, to address staff shortages, uh, use their technology to improve patient flow, and adding or upgrading facilities and equipment to improve their capacity. Um, a couple of elements here uh, for consideration for inclusion in, in a budget order condition um, would be the, in specific to uh, UVM Medical Center, develop and implement a strategic plan to address access to care and patient wait times and uh, share or present that plan to the board. <clears throat> um, uh, UVM Medical Center and board staff work to identify applicable measures to track access to care. Um, this was something that Dr. Brumstead alluded to in, in his letter as well. And then have a quarterly uh, reporting from the Medical Center uh, leadership and potentially their uh, representative of their board or board chair have that reporting to the board on progress on their strategic plan and their wait time measures. Um, 
that could be done. Uh, that you could specify that that be done at a public board meeting. Uh, and those were the uh, conditions um, or the elements of a condition that we're presenting um, for consideration. Questions from the board for Russ? Comments from the board? So I, this is Robin, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I like the idea of getting a planning document um, to address the access to care and patient wait times and developing ways to measure appropriately the access to care. That's something that we have done in the non-financial reporting or I should say we started to do in the non-financial reporting pre-pandemic, but then of course, due to the pandemic, kind of uh, let go of the non-financial reporting on a temporary basis. Um, so I think developing that so we can consistently track it is a great idea. Um, and I like, I like the idea of having the public um, information to kind of show how it's going and and where there's improvement um i also think that these elements could help um provide some background information and data to the um group that's going to be from ahs us and dfr that's going to be looking into the issue uh, and so I guess the question, I know that that hasn't really gotten started yet, I don't think, um, or I guess I should say I don't think that's gotten started yet, but I just wanted to check in to see um, if Jess or Kevin knew more about whether there are additional information or ways that we can ensure that our order dovetails with that investigation. So just to be clear, the investigation is a statewide look at access. And so um, there has been um, behind the scenes work being uh, conducted, including from some members of our staff and uh, led by our board member, Jessica Holm. So Jessica, do you want to say anything? Sure. Um, I think, yeah, like you said, that inquiry that that is going to be a statewide um, look at access across the state. Um, we are right now kind of working on a scope of work that various teams at AHS and Green Mountain Care Board and DFR will be doing. So more to be um, coming out on that scope of work, looking at it across the whole state. I think that uh, to the degree that we have learned and seen some data um, that suggests that there are access issues at our academic medical center, um, and that the budget is designed in part to address some of those access issues and realizing how important it is to ensure that Vermonters have access to in particular specialty care and imaging and, and many of these uh, services that we know have you know long wait times at the moment. So I think that this work would be coincident with the work that's being done by um, the statewide you know teams looking at access across the state. I think this would inform that work. And I, I like the way Russ has outlined this. Um, and I think it's really important that, that you know, we as the board, you know, we do care about access. Access is a fundamental component of every regulatory process that we do at the board. So I think keeping tabs, understanding the strategies and tactics that UVM is deploying to improve patient flow is really important. And again, I agree with Robin and Kevin that, that having that information be available to the public uh, is important. So I support this. Other board members? Just want to make sure that I didn't lose Maureen because I don't see her. Um, yes. Am I here? I support it as well. Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> I lost you for a minute. <laughs> I was lost. <laughs> Tom, anything? 
on this particular? No, I, I support it. I, I've read the letter and it all makes sense to me. Robin, are you uh, prepared to make a motion? Sure. Um, I move that we condition, include a condition in the UVM hospital budget order, uh, which would require UVM MC to develop and implement a strategic plan to address access to care and patient wait times and to share that plan with the board um, to ask UVM MC and direct our staff to work to identify applicable measures to track access to care and to require UVM MC to make quarterly progress reports um, to the board um, Prefer I'm I, I think I'm gonna leave out the public meeting part, Kevin. Just um sorry to interrupt my own motion with a comment, but <laughs> um I'm because I think that that gives flexibility should there be another spike in the pandemic for you and staff to work out the format. So I'm gonna leave it as provide quarterly reports um on the progress of the plan and measurement um as in a format directed by the chair. And since uh, Robin has included me in the motion, I just want to make it clear that whenever possible, I really think that uh, they should be in public. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Is there board discussion on the motion? I'll open it up to public comment before we vote on the motion. Is there any member of the public who wishes to speak at this time? And Ham Davis, I see your hand raised. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kevin. There's been a lot of writing about this access problem, which I think is actually uh, is, is worse than is generally understood. So I have a, a fact question. I wonder if you'd ask the hospital. The There's been different numbers put out about uh, the recruitment of new resources, per, per, you know, people, doctors and nurses that would be necessary to get the uh, the access problem under control. M the numbers I have are 75 new doctors and 250 nurses. Could you ask the hospital whether those numbers are accurate? I don't know if Dr. Brumstead or Steve Leffler are on this call or not. Is there someone from UVM who would like to address the question? Yeah, I'm, all yeah, I can I'm tell you, I see Rick Vincent hand up, so go ahead, Rick. Rick will know. Here we go. Good morning. Um, yeah, I think those numbers are in the ballpark, Cam, but um, we'll we'll have to to validate. Uh, I, I'm not sure where um, where those came from, but they sound um, they sound like they're um, they're close. I think as a follow up, Rick, uh, one of the things that uh, was troubling to some of the board members, at least, was in response to a question. It might have been Steve who had the answer during the hearing that most of them are already there as travelers. And so we're, we weren't convinced that uh, um, there's going to be an additional uh, capacity to uh, uh, meet the pent up demand. And do you, do you have any information on that, Rick? So yeah, we do have a lot of travelers um, at the moment um, that are filling open positions. So part of that recruitment certainly is um, in terms of nurses and uh, other clinical staff is definitely um, to replace those higher cost uh, travelers that we have. Does that answer your question, Ham? Uh, 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 sort of, um, but but your your, your question um, that was my second question because Jessica Holmes in the in the original hearing asked about that and uh, and I think he she was told at the time that it was that on the uh, that that the that much of, or if not all of the deficit in terms of available personnel 
uh, involve that shift from travel to permanent. I, I'm not sure. The, the only so so that's just, that's fine. I, I, I'm I'm ready to take Rick's numbers. The other comment I have that um, the comment that I have that this 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 met, this um, motion is perfectly harmless. I mean, it has no effect. These if these people weren't doing what the motion calls for them to do, they should all be fired tomorrow or yesterday. And so they're obviously going to do that. Um, my only thing, the thing I think is missing is that I've heard, is that I have heard, uh, not in this letter from John Brumstead, but I have jo heard John Brumstead say the current situation with lack of, ac of difficulty of access to, um, to um, the services at the Medical Center Hospital of Vermont are not, are not uh, justified, are not tolerable. I think John Brumstead knows that. My, whether this motion is out there or not. I, I know I don't think he knows that. I know he knows that. I don't think anybody disagrees with you, Ham, and I, I could see pain in the face of uh, Dr. Uh, Leffler when uh, he was trying to address the issue. I think if uh, um, there was a magic way to find the providers that are necessary, they would have been found, and we're all going to have to work together to make sure that everybody understands that Vermont is the beckoning land right now. It's a great place to work. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to, to raise your family. And we need to do all that we can to get that message out to providers around the country to um, give consideration to coming here because they would have a great quality of life. That answers my question. <laughs> Thank you, Ham. Is there any other public comment? If not, is there any further board discussion on the motion? This is Robin. I would just chime in with one other uh, point, which is I think the staffing issues are absolutely critical and key, but I also think um, that there may be other underlying causes, um, and this is totally anecdotal, so I hope that this is something that comes out of the planning efforts as a real understanding of what's pushing on the access to care, but you know, at least in central Vermont, scheduling seems to be a real issue in terms of getting into UVMMC. And so I, I have this inkling that there could be operations improvements um, that would also help with access to care. I don't know what those are. I don't pretend to be an operations person, but I hope that, um, you know, there, that there's a close look taken at multiple potential issues that could be contributed to the access. And that's not to minimize the staffing concerns because I, you know, I, that was something that I raised several times during the hearings is my concerns around that, but, but that I think it's a little more complicated. And I hope that we can get a better understanding of that uh, from UVMMC in the future. Thanks. And I think it is, you're absolutely correct that it's a multi-pronged uh, effect that has to be looked at. And uh, anecdotally, we've all heard stories of not just at uh, the health network's central scheduling, but other hospitals in the state too that have adopted the central scheduling. We've heard some horror stories. And we know that uh, the whole purpose of implementing EPIC was to try to create some efficiencies as well too. So I think there are operational efficiencies that um, can be achieved. I think UVM's already working on those. Um, I, I don't want to uh, downplay the, the work that they've done um, by voting on this motion. It's just that uh, I think that uh, uh, it's so important that Vermonters have access to care that um, anything that just keeps uh, prodding people is a good thing. Hearing no further discussion, I'm going to call the, the question. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was a unanimous vote on the motion. Patrick, if you could back it up a slide. Is anybody prepared to make a motion on um, the remaining pieces of UVM's um, budget? 
I was hoping to hear from, from other folks around the change in charge request. Before and I Tom, you had given us a, a preview that you had some things to say, so now would be the time. <laughs> well, good. I'm. Uh, it's, it, this will take a few minutes, but I, I just, um, you know, I felt as I was going through the network's budgets that a lot of the time I was kind of looking at trees and there's a big forest out there that just not, that's just not being addressed. And we saw this in rate review um, where the it seems that the hospitals and the commercial carriers are talking past each other on health care reform. And I'll just give you a, a taste of that from, from the record, you know, where during the Blue Cross Blue Shield um, rate review hearings, and I referenced this in, in my discussions on the hospital budgets, you know, they say, so I will say Blue Cross is fully committed to health care reform, including payment reform as well. But it is true that, you know, it takes two to tango. We need willing partners in that. And we have found some willing partners. But, you know, even at the time of the downturn in hospital services, we reached out and spoke to facilities, you know, <clears throat> would you want to set up a fixed prospective payment mechanism? And none of them took us up on it. So we do not have, so we do have one facility, and I think this is Southern Vermont, through one care who was involved in fixed prospective payment. And I'm sure others will get there over time, but it's, you know, it's different world for, for, for uh, the providers as well. And Mr. Lombardo from MVP kind of gave the same kind of tone uh, that basically says, so I just think, you know, those conversations it takes too. It either has to be both parties are willing to adopt a model and come to common terms, or there has to be a mandate in place. So those are the two items I think you can, you can know without having somebody say so. You must do this or else you're going to face some sort of penalty. So that's one side of the conversation. And then during hospital reviews here, you know, uh, Mr. Vincent from UVM, and I think rightfully so, said, I can certainly start just to clarify one aspect of how we are looking at the numbers and, and that we do participate with in Blue Cross Blue Shield for all three of our Vermont hospitals. We participate in Blue Cross and Blue Shield and MVP ACO programs, but these programs are not FPP, fixed prospective payments meaning the program has a spend target, but we settle at the end of the year instead of having a fixed payment throughout the year. And we have, you know, the place that we have been for a while is a, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, is, is a fixed payment that reconciles to fee for service, really doesn't have value. All it does really is create an administrative burden and creates uh, uncertainty in our financial statements that we need to stay on top of. And then Mr. Brumstead, um, you know, later on uh, talking about fixed prospective payments. Well, I'll just say that we we would be first up if any commercial payer wants to come forward with actuarially derived total cost of care targets and are willing to allow us to have the portion of the premium that would flow through the ACO to support care management, be first in line. And then in response to a question that Robin had asked um, about Medicare Advantage plan, Mr. Brumstein had said, and that's why I said we are all in. If any commercial payer wants to come to us with a, an opportunity that, that's in that construct, I would hope it would come through the ACO. But if it comes directly to UVM Health Network, we will take that. Obviously, it depends on the details, but we, <clears throat> you know it is actually early uh, derived total cost of care target, and we uh, on the provider side can be held accountable for how the care is delivered. And that's what we are all about. And that's our core strategy. So, I mean, so though there's the conflict, but the numbers here to me are compelling. Um, so if you look at uh, Robin, um, uh, the, the system-wide of, uh, of our staff uh, view of these budgets, you'll find that across all hospitals, um, the FPP is 13.8%, but Medicare um, is 33.8%, Medicaid is 42.9% FPP, and commercial is three-tenths of 1%. I mean, that's to me is incredible. They're the biggest number. Um, they're uh, they're $1.6 billion 
but according to the information that hospitals sent us, um, we there's only a little less than five five million dollars in FPP. And for the network, uh, just briefly, for the, the medical center, the Medicaid FPP is 32% of their total Medicaid. Uh, the Medicare FPP is 29.8% of their total Medicare, and the commercial is five tenths of one percent of their total commercial. And for Porter, uh, the numbers are similarly 66% for Medicaid, 38% for Medicare, but one tenth of one percent for commercial. And for Central Vermont, uh, it's 36.2% for Medicaid, 38.2% uh, for Medicare, and just two, a negative uh, two tenths of one percent for um, for uh, for commercial. So I, I basically think that we have a reform system that where everything flows downhill to the commercial carriers and this gap between um, hospitals and commercial insurers kind of coming to terms you know, with, with, with some methods. And um, absent that, uh, you know, I, you know I, I mean, we spend a lot of time or spend a lot of time on slides 32 through 34 in UVM's presentation, looking at the cost shift and and understanding it and 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 how it occurs, but that's not going to get fixed as long as the relationship between the hospitals and the commercial folks are on a uh, fee for service basis. So um, I just you know I I kind of want to get that out there because to me it's huge when you have you know on a system wide basis uh, commercial. Uh, uh, payments at 1.6 billion and only three tenths of one percent is FPP, and I'm talking true FPP here. Um, it's 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 a big hole in the system, and I, I'm hoping that we can begin to address this uh, through the budget process. And when we get to the motion, I, I will have an amendment, you know, to to try to do that. But um, you know, as long as you know the the commercial folks and the hospitals kind of cannot get together on uh, on finding ways to um, uh, for payment reform between them. Um, I think that we, we will just be in a stall and that will be really unfortunate because the systems are in place to do what we have to do now. You know, we have the ACO. We have experiences with Medicaid FPP. We have experiences with Medicare FPP, a whole variety of things. Uh, but yet, uh, when it comes to the relationship between hospitals and the commercial carriers, it's 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 a non-entity. So that's 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 my pitch, and I will have you know some verbiage, which I don't know how well crafted it is. Robin is uh, uh, my mentor on all this stuff, and uh, she wasn't around uh, at five o'clock this morning. <laughs> so. Uh, um, but I, I think I just don't think that we should let this go by, by the boards. I think that the board has to be the adult in the room, and I, I, I'm, well, I'll, I'll withdraw that the the board has to be the person that grabs both the hospitals and the commercial carriers by the scruff of the neck and say, "You guys got to talk to each other and come up with solutions because you're such a big piece of the healthcare payment system in Vermont." That if you don't get together, uh, it, it, it's a it, it, the, the opportunities that healthcare reform offers uh, are just going to fall by the boards. So thanks for the time. Other board members. <laughs> So my suggestion would be uh, for Tom to do his motion as as sort of, a, I'm assuming, I don't know what it is, Tom, but I'm assuming it's something like adding a condition. Um, I think it would make sense to talk about that before we do the number piece and the rest of it like we did with the access to care. Um, and my question for you, Tom, is was, are you whatever your suggestion is, is it just for UVM or for all three of the network hospitals? Um, it would be for the network hospitals. I mean, they they together are 62% of all uh, NPR FPP. I mean, they're, 
they're a big entity. And so if the network hospitals, you know, can use their negotiating power with the commercial insurance to um, uh, fire up uh, healthcare reform payments, uh, a payment system, then uh, it's huge. The, the, the scale here is extraordinary and the leverage is extraordinary. And, you know, we're four years into healthcare reform and we're still down to less than a percent of commercial payments uh, being pursuant to fixed prospective payments or some kind of uh, pay payment reform that we're, that everybody else is striving toward and that we have in place with Medicaid and Medicare, but they're still cost shifting as we saw from those slides that UVM presented, they're still cost, cost shifting uh, onto the commercial payers. And it's just not a balanced system and it's actually getting more and more out of balance every year. Tom, are you prepared to make a motion at this time? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> uh, I'll probably need Robin's help, but this is what I came up with. And so it's a further, I'm separating this from everything else so it can be a clean up and down um, or a non-entity, whatever, wherever this ends up. But so it would be further the University of Vermont Medical Center shall using best efforts to negotiate payment reforms with commercial payers such that not less than 25% of such payments in fiscal year 2020 shall be true fixed prospective payments and that UVM uh, Medical Center's 2023 budget proposal will reflect at least 30% of commercial payments as true fixed prospective payments. And I picked those numbers because they are lower than the rates system-wide um, and within the network for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, so um, just trying to ramp up here um, and, and get uh, the commercial payment system you know, on, on the table and uh, so that Mr. Brumstead and his folks and the folks at Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP and others, you know, can uh, uh, tango is one of the comments was it takes two to tango and I'm, I'm trying to get them to tango. Thank you, Tom. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second it for the purposes of discussion. And board discussion on the motion. So I have, to, I have a, and I, given your 5 a.m. comment, I fully expect you have not had a chance to do this, Tom, but has legal had a chance to think about this and, and talk with you about the condition in terms of the, within the scope of our authority? Uh, no, they have not. They, okay. you know, it, it was one of these things actually that I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And I said, yeah. this is, this is absurd. I mean, here, here we are nibbling around the edges in a way in terms of the financials, uh, having read the slideshow. And then you've got this huge issue out here that's not even being addressed at all. But and no, they haven't. And that, that's certainly, uh, um, they, they, you know, I, I knew that that was a flawed. Look, approach. 5 a.m. thoughts happen, you know? <laughs> I'm glad you did not call me at 5 a.m. though. Thank you for doing that um, or for not doing that. Um, and then my other question for you is, would you be open to a mo to a condition that would ask for best efforts to, to negotiate and to design a, a true FPP commercial program without the targets? And the reason I ask that is because the targets are directly related to the number of patients who can be attributed through primary care. And personally, I don't feel like I know whether those targets are achievable given the potential, the potential of the attributed population. So I would want more analysis and backup before I was comfortable agreeing to particular targets, because I just don't know if that's achievable or not, given sort of the primary care footprint in Chittenden County, that it's a re the demographics there are largely healthy. And so with traditional attribution, for example, healthy people tend not to get attributed because they don't seek care, because they don't need care. And so there are those more technical wonky issues that I'm concerned about in terms of the targets. And 
And just to follow up on that, uh, I have the same concern, Tom, and it's not just about um, whether or not uh, it's a realistic number. It's the fact that you're placing a, a condition on a party when um, really it involves more than that party. And so um, if the carriers flat out said no, we would have a problem. And so I, I fully support the, the way that you're going about this and requiring some type of uh, um, reporting or feedback on the best efforts to get to fixed prospective payments. But once you start to put in a target that could be subject to some type of enforcement, um, it gets a little bit uh, concerning to me when we hit, uh, haven't had a chance to uh, fully flesh it out. Yep. No, I agree with that. And that, that's that's why I, I said using best efforts clause, but just to soften it a little bit. But I, you know, I, I'm kind of, you know, uh, Robin's suggestion is fine with me. I, I'm just trying to put some teeth into uh, Dr. Brumstead's statement that, you know, we're all in and um, you will be first in line. Um, but I think the folks at UVM network have to sit down with the, the, the commercial folks and um, and say we're, we're going we're going to leave the room with something that we can work with um, rather than every year uh, you know the water goes over the dam and uh, uh, this just this issue just does not get addressed so uh, I'm just trying to get the two parties that we've seen in two sets of hearings to actually do something. And it's got to be between them. It's not something we can do for them because, you know, we're not a payer. So that's what I, I mean. I, Robin's suggestion is, is a good one. And her criticism, not criticism, but her, her flashing orange uh, are all legitimate in my mind. And one thing too, Tom, is I would hope that um, likewise in future rate review hearings that you um, do similar language on the carriers as well, so it's a, a two-way street. Well, Kevin, you may remind, you may remember we actually uh, had legal look into that, and we we have some legal authority issues with conditioning the rate review, but we did include in the um, orders strong language that Tom helped legal work on in terms of encouragement to do exactly that. Yeah. I mean, if the opinion was legal, is that we uh, need to go through a rule process um, to to put that uh, requirement in, and I think that's something we can pursue. But um, you know, I, I did plot, um, and if you read my concurring opinions uh, on the uh, uh, rate review decisions, you'll see that I was very clear there um, about uh, the, the weak capitation of, um, among the commercial payers. Yes, I, you're consistent, Tom. And just uh, I keep in mind that we do have a large group filing in front of us uh, as well. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd like to just add. I mean, I, I think um, I think the time to put this in would be more, you know, in guidance than than at this point, you know, in conditioning. Um, and I think that the board could facilitate this throughout the year by getting the parties together and, and having conversations about it. So, you know, with the with the revisions we just put in about the, you know, in the last um, approval we just did, I'm, I'm not sure putting this in at this time is the right time and place, you know, would just really be my concern. Um, but, you know, would like to hear if anyone else feels that as well. Um, I guess where I sit is I, I share the same concerns that um, Kevin and Robin raised around specific targets. And I think it sounds like you're already off that um, part of the motion, Tom, but I support the spirit of the motion. Uh, I, I don't know about the legality and the achievability of those targets, but, uh, and actually I think Maureen now raises an interesting question around whether it belongs in hospital budget orders or whether it belongs better in budget guidance. Of course, the concern about waiting until budget guidance is that that's next March and the work needs to be done now so that the, you know, we can move further on fixed prospective payment on the commercial sector. So I guess I would love to hear from legal on this and where it belongs and how we might achieve this. But also I would not be in favor of those specific targets. So it would have to be the revised language that Robin suggested. 
So I'll, I'll turn it over to legal, but I will say that uh, it sometimes is unfair to um, throw questions out to legal when they haven't had a chance to do the legal research, but maybe they've done enough research on on uh, this uh, issue since Tom has continually brought it up that they're prepared. Russ, are you prepared? Can I also just add, uh, I think if we're gonna get in legal advice from our legal counsel that that should be done in executive session. Um, so if Russ should, when he says whether or not he's prepared, perhaps he could say whether he agrees. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll say, that uh, yeah, a kind of full discussion of the board's um, you know express and implied authority under statute might be something that the board considers appropriate for uh, an executive session. Um, ha having said that, I'm not sure that I'm prepared right now to. Um, have that discussion in a really and and give you advice in a really meaningful way uh, on this on this particular question. So could I make a suggestion that um, we and table the motion for now um, and maybe come back to it after we give Russ a chance to look it in, into it, which may mean leaving the budget open on this condition until after, you know, after, since it's gonna apply to the next three, um, we may need to leave it open and come back later in the afternoon, assuming we get through everything this morning otherwise, or Wednesday morning, depending on Russ's timing. I, I I won't do this again in in Central Vermont or Porter's because I I just I wanted to make the point I wanted to get these this data out there about how wide the gap is and uh, how unbalanced the system is and I I feel that that's a, that's occurring here um, but um, I'm willing to work work with legal in terms of guidance or you know whatever whatever the path forward is that can you know, coalesce us all around um, a strategy here, because I think we all see it as a big flaw in the system, but it's a fixable flaw. So I'm not even sure how to take that, Tom. Are you saying that you're withdrawing your motion, or are you saying that uh, um, you agree with Robin that uh, we should come back to it uh, um, later today? Uh, no, I, I agree with Robin that we should come back to it later today, um, and that it applies to all three. If and if if there's a simple way, I don't want to make this too complicated. It can get very complicated. But if there's a simple way to to you know get rid of the specific targets and fold in some language that uh, you know causes the parties to get together and come up with recommended solutions, um, um, that, that would be fine with me as well. Maybe at lunch, Robin, I I can talk. Well, hopefully legal is part of that conversation. Right. Okay. Well, I, I expect Russ to be fully prepared by noon. <laughs> well, I, I don't expect him to be fully prepared. And if, quite frankly, if he needs till Wednesday, I'm, I'm prepared to uh, wait till then because I don't want any rush decisions from legal. Yeah, okay. So um, – with that, Robin, do you want, wish to make a, a another motion? I'm considering the other motion tabled. Yes, I move um, that we table Tom's motion uh, pending um, a discussion with our legal team. Second. Is there a second? Thank you. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. With that, Robin, are you prepared to make a, a different motion? Yeah, I'd like to make some comments too on this. If we're, <laughs> I think Jess and I have been commenting. Um, so a couple things. Uh, I guess first, Patrick, if you could go to page 121, and we can kind of be looking at the, that page. Um, you know, of course, UVM is the largest hospital and has all the issues that we've been discussing so far with access and staffing and inflationary increases and stress workforce. Um, the three network hospitals are requesting 
the highest commercial rate increases in comparison to the all, all of the other hospitals, which only increases the cost shift and individuals utilizing commercial insurance, which factors into their personal care decisions, you know, often delay care. And, you know, and so the one of the questions is, you know, what's what's the right balance and, and how do we look at this? You know, the issues that were impacted UVM were not just COVID this year. They included the issues at Fannie Allen and they included the cyber attack. Both of those contributed uh, approximately, uh, I think the cyber attack was $50 million in losses and the Fannie Allen was $8 million in losses. So we had almost $60 million. And the reason I look at this page is where would we have been, you know, in this operating margin had those things not happened? Um, you know, we, we talked about certainly they got money from from the feds for COVID, but uh, 21 would have been significantly higher, you know, had, had those things not not impacted um, the bottom line. And fortunately, they stand to recoup about $30 million in insurance money, um, some of which they're going to need to invest in protecting against further attacks on the COVID. Um, but this benefit is not reflected in this operating income. So when we look at where where should the rate increase changes, well, one other thing on the um, when we look at the NPR, I'm not convinced they can get to the to the billion five that they're looking at. Um, you know, historically, they've they missed significantly this year with a million three. They definitely have, you know, impacted from the COVID, uh, from the cyber and from Fannie Allen. So that's going to help achieve that. Um, but but I do want to say, I'm not saying we should adjust their NPR, but, but it is still potentially a stretch to get to that billion five, um, particularly since we've heard about not having the staffing and the ability, you know, the appointment delays, things like that. I mean, you kind of need the staff in order to be able to achieve the, the top line number. So, so that that could be um, stressful. When we look at some of the areas, you know, going back to commercial rate, one percent is is six million dollars. We're looking at, um, you know, the recommendation by the staff of decreasing that by one point. Um, I'm not sure that's enough. You know, I, I still want to hear what, what other people are thinking. I mean, you know, 5% would still be high. Last year, they got 2% extra for COVID. Um, you know, one of the areas we, we did go back and forth and get some information on the commercial rate request increase and the buildup, um, which is basically offsetting all the inflation um, of $40 million. Um, but there are some questions still on, you know, bad debt and free care and the, the projections they have in bad debt and free care and what appeared to possibly be um, double counting as they put the commercial rate in. And to give the numbers for that, in 2019, the, the actual costs for bad debt and free care were $46 million in 2020, the projection is $45 million, yet their, their budget had been $58 million, but they're coming in at $45 million. And now in 2022, the projection is $61 million. So quite a swing going from the last two years actuals up $16 million in, in free care um, and bad debt. So you know, if I were to say where where would I think they may get some of the reduction if we did reduce commercial would certainly be in that area. Um, you know, another area that's always striking is when you go to their reconciliation sheets on their expense, um, what the expense changes are year over year, you know, highlighted is, is clearly the um, inflation, but cost savings is zero on all three of their submissions. Um, nothing for cost savings. I'm not saying they don't have cost savings. Um, they're going to say that it's embedded in everything that they do and it's offsetting other areas. But, you know, I know I've repeatedly brought up every year that 
you know, we can't be the most efficient hospital, you know, in all areas and that there always is room to, to save in your supply chain and efficiencies. And, you know, I would hope we would have more and more of those. We're supposed to be getting the legacy offsets from Epic and the staffing offsets. Um, you know, those have been somewhat delayed. So I'm, I'm torn. You know, we're obviously it's still in the midst of COVID. We, we have access issues. We have staffing issues. Um, when we when we do rate declines, as we've done in the past, um, the network brings up how we're, you know, hurting the hospital and, and the ability for them to make up these losses. And I understand that, but I'm looking at what happened this year with Fannie Allen, with with the cyber, you know, that's far more than any rate reduction impacts that we've done. So, um, you know, that, that needs to be in consideration. The fact that there's potentially $30 million more coming in to the bottom line and the cash position is very strong, um, stronger than it's been in a dollar basis and in a day's cash on hand, um, does play into consideration when we look at this. So, you know, the, the, the dilemma is balancing what the commercial rate payers have to pay and knowing that people tell us repeatedly that they, they don't go for care, they delay care because they can't afford to pay their deductibles. Um, balance with the access and quality and, and everything else that we need to have at the network. So, you know, I'm, I'm somewhere between the, the five and the six of the recommendation of the staff. Um, and again, I, I do think that, you know, when we ask for that commercial rate reconciliation, the other thing I, I do want to point out on bridges, we keep missing the first quarter um, because the rate came in last year. That That's still on a bridge is a rate change. It's, it's not utilization. Last year's first quarter um, impact from this year is a 6% rate increase. So we're getting a 6% rate increase in the October through December time period. And that needs to be shown in these bridge charts. I mean, we're only showing the impact of quarters two, three, and four on the chart. And in some of their responses, it's, well, it's, it's offset by inflation. That may well be, but on an NPR basis, it's, it's not utilization, it's it's rate. You still get that first quarter of rate this year and you'll get it next year on this rate increase. So I, I just wanna make sure there's some you know reconciliation um, when we talk about that in the future. So you know that's all I'm gonna say now and uh, you know would love to hear what what Jess and Kevin specifically have to say. I mean we're we're in tough times and I understand that. Um, but I do want to put in perspective some of the impacts that this year has had for other things beyond COVID that have dramatically impacted the bottom line. And again, fortunately, some of that $30 million should be coming back um, in you know, probably the non-operating line, but, but th that was from operations. So I, I think we need to make sure we're not somehow passing that on to the ratepayers um, because of the significant issues that the hospital had and the Fannie Allen was a repeat issue. Um, and that was stated to be $8 million at the bottom line impact for that. Thank you, Maureen. And uh, my apologies to everyone. I should have asked for uh, a bio break uh, at some point earlier. I, I know that uh, um, we've been on this call for uh, some time now, and I think it's most appropriate that we do take a, a 10 minute bio break before we continue, because I think this is gonna go on. Um, just for everyone's uh, knowledge, what I plan to do once we come back from our bio break is to keep going to somewhere around 1245. And at that point, we'll take um, a two hour lunch break to try to give uh, legal and others um, opportunities to um, do what's necessary to try to proceed. Um, we'll come back at uh, approximately 245, depending on when we actually um, do go to lunch. And then um, we will um, keep moving through today, get done what we can, and whatever can't be done today will take up again Wednesday morning. So with that, I'm going to put this meeting in recess until 11.10, and uh, we'll reconvene at 11.10. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to reconvene the, uh, the meeting. And uh, we're in, under discussions of the UVMMC budget for fiscal year 22. 
and we're in board discussion on that and I'll open it up for um, board members. Kevin, I, I guess I can hop in here. Um, and I want to thank Maureen for many of her excellent points. I agree with many of them. In part, that's what makes this such a tough year. Uh, literally, this budget and the change in charge request has kept me up at night, literally. Uh, but ultimately, I think my thoughts on this year's UVMMC budget are inextricably linked to access and the issues that we're seeing in our system, and particularly um, at UVM Medical Center. So given the pent-up demand throughout the state, um, and the current pandemic conditions, I'm comfortable with the NPR request submitted in UVMMC's budget. I look at that additional revenue that UVMMC is requesting as a reflection of the need for uh, services, right, to meet that pent up demand. And we see, we know that there's documented population growth in Chittenden County that they're managing. We're also seeing the acuity at many of the smaller hospitals being sent up to UVM. So I, I believe that it's possible for them to achieve that NPR growth. And I think, you know, to the degree that we can't ask UVMMC to work harder to expand access to deal with long wait times and unmet need without recognizing the revenue that those services are going to generate for the hospital. Uh, so I agree with the staff recommendation on NPR. I also agree with the staff change in charge recommendation of 6%. Um, again, like I said, this, this change in charge request has kept me up at night. Uh, the 7% ask that the medical center requested. Uh, I did not find enough compelling arguments to support the 7%, but I can support the staff's recommendation for a change in charge request of 6%. And I fully recognize, as again, what's kept me up at night, uh, that approving a 6% commercial rate is really tough to swallow. Uh, but what's tougher for me to swallow, I think, is thinking that we as a board have will be limiting, if we reduce it below that, limiting the resources necessary for the medical center to address what I think we all see now as a patient access crisis. I think UVM needs to hire more providers, more technicians, more non-clinical support staff, frankly, maybe even more than what's currently in their budget to adequately deal with wait times, particularly if they're, if as they said in their hearing, they're already staffed up with travelers and they still can't meet the need, they may need to hire even more than they've budgeted. Um, to deal with those wait times and that need. I think to the degree that they're hiring more people, they're gonna need to expand office space, right? To accommodate those new personnel. They're gonna need to purchase new equipment to eliminate long patient backlogs, particularly, for example, the MRI machine. And I also think they're gonna need the resources to build that inpatient mental health capacity that we need them to build to break through the log jams that we're seeing in EDs throughout the state. All of that's gonna take significant resources. We rely on the tertiary care center to do all of that. I will note, you know, for example, there's no other state or private entity that's stepped up to significantly expand inpatient site capacity, despite a well-recognized long-term acute need. So the, the UVM Medical Center is stepping up to do that. The health network is stepping up to do that. And I think they're going to need the resources to be able to, to accommodate that. Um, I want to make a comment about we're seeing these resources being constrained. We're seeing expenses rising. And this is to Tom's point about the cost shift. Public payers, namely Medicaid and Medicare, we know are not adjusting their reimbursements to cover the very real inflationary pressures that we're seeing right now. So I very much appreciated Dr. Brumstead's recent letter to the DIVA commissioner requesting an increase in payment rates from Medicaid. If Medicaid rates had kept pace with inflation, these commercial rate asks would not be as high. And I also suspect that patient access would be better. I learned just last week that there are independent specialty practices in Chittenden County that are not accepting Medicaid patients. That not only reduces patient access, but it exacerbates the wait times at UVMMC uh, specialty practices, right? So it's all they're all related. So I guess I would say, although it's a really tough one, tough one for me to swallow, I am in favor of approving a change in charge of 6% with you know, I'd like to see some language in the budget order that UVMC commit to prioritizing and mitigate the patient access crisis where it has discretion in its budgetary allocations, which I think they will be doing, particularly if there's this this reporting component as well. But uh, ask them to prioritize, you know, where they have discretion to mitigate this patient access crisis. And I wonder if there's other language that we might be able to add to the budget budget order requesting UVM 
to ensure they have enough navigators on staff, other personnel on staff to help secure insurance coverage and or facilitate reasonable payment arrangements for patients and families that are facing financial difficulty covering the cost of their care. So ensuring that some of these patients who may be eligible for Medicaid can get on Medicaid, for example, um, things like that. So at the end of the day, um, I support this. It's very challenging. Uh, it's a hard one to support, but I, I recognize the resources that are necessary to ensure that we have the access that we need as Vermonters. And we rely on our tertiary care center for that. If I don't know if this is possible, but if NPR or margin looks mid-year like it's exceeding budget, how you know could we uh, think about, or I would guess I would like to see UVM come in for a self-driven downward rate adjustment as Rutland has done in the past, right? We've seen that happen where when budgets are running hot, Rutland has come in and said, hey, we're gonna do a commercial rate cut. Uh, so it would be nice if, if for some reason UVM finds themselves in that position or in the financial position, or if they get the $30 million uh, associated with the settlement, could they come in and, and do a self-driven downward rate adjustment mid-year? I'd love to see that happen. Uh, I'd also love to see next time, next year, the commercial rate ask from UVM be much lower. Do either to the insurance settlements from the cyber attack, better reimbursements from Medicaid, strong investment returns, cost savings initiatives, as Maureen mentioned, the need for more of them. But at this point, I guess I recognize the crisis we're in, and I'm in favor of providing the resources necessary to UVM to alleviate that crisis and ensure that we don't have patients waiting for three months for an MRI or six months to see a specialist. So that's where I sit at the moment. My computer told me I was muted, believe it or not. <laughs> so I, I just want to weigh in as well in that uh, on the NPR front, I think uh, that there are a number of things that are going, going to cause um, uh, upward uh, movement in NPR. And um, just to tick those off, we've we realized that this year, they were impacted, as Maureen aptly pointed out, by the implementation of EPIC, by Fannie Allen, by the cyber attack. Um, these are all things that um, kept their NPR um, down from what it could have been in the year. Plus, uh, this is a hospital that was one of the latest ones to have patients coming back and um, actually utilizing hospital care because of fear uh, related to COVID. So because of that, I think that there's gonna be um, more pent up demand at UVM than any other hospital in the state in 22, because most other hospitals at some point during 22 should have um, caught up with the pent up demand. UVM, I'm not sure will have caught up so um, NPR, uh, I just don't uh, see a, a huge reduction being appropriate at this at this point in time. Change of charge, I agree with everything that Maureen said on the change of charge. This is a hospital that was given a 6% increase last year. They never got the full benefit of that 6% uh, change in charge. Um, because of all the things that I just cited in the discussion on NPR. And now as they um, are, are moving through that, they sh should see the benefits of last year's change. So uh, I do think that um, uh, a 7% uh, increase in change of charge is not warranted. And I think that um, Maureen also mentioned already the possibility of $30 million. We don't know if that will come in this year or not. Dealing with insurance companies is not often the easiest thing to do, but I think we all um, realize that at some point in time, that money should be coming into UVM. And so these are all um, factors in, in uh, my belief that um, there should be a reduction, and I support the staff's recommendation at the 6%. Other board members? I'll just um, chime in. I, I can 
go along with the six percent, although I do think it's still higher than what's warranted based on um, you know some of the comments that I had. But with all of the uncertainties that still prevail, um, you know, I, I, I you know would stress what Jess pointed out, which is whether there's an ability for a mid-year adjustment or you know certainly next year the expectation that it's not just the simple map of, of here's my inflation and my commercial increase is just going to offset that because there need to be efficiencies. We'll be able to see what does happen with bad debt free care, which again is up $16 million from their budget to um, from their budget this year to what they're forecasting um, in 21 and what they and their actuals in 20. So that's pretty significant. Um, but I can support the six percent. Other board members? Yeah, um, I, I can support the six percent too. I um, come at it from a, a slightly different perspective, and you know, fully recognize all of the moving parts that the university has had to deal with over the last couple of years, um, and just knowing that it's a um, Cha not chaotic, but a difficult situation and that there is a lot of uncertainty and that uncertainty will translate uh, into the numbers. But um, when I look at the staff recommendation and seeing the reduction in NPR 5.6 million, I go, go to one of my favorite places, which is the provider tax. And um, <clears throat> I noticed that um, in uh, 2020, the provider tax uh, was 5.3% of NPR FFP. And this year, um, they let, and for 2021 um, projected, they have it in at 76.3 million, which is an 11.1% increase, keeping in mind that the tax is, is a constant at 6% tied toward uh, to NPR FPP. And for 2022, they're looking at a 12.6% increase to $85.9 million, and uh, which is which is a 6.66%. So we have uh, 2020 actual over 2019 actual as a hard number, 5.3% in 2020, and uh, they're projecting for 2022 a a 6.66% uh, equivalent. And that, if you reduce that back down to six, just 6%, six uh, um, that's eight and a half million dollars in savings there. So it gives me some comfort that, you know, there are reductions, you know, in this budget possibly that can be made that don't affect access, don't affect quality of care. Um, and, and paying the provider tax, I think, is one of those. So I'm I'm okay at a six point oh five percent. So why don't I go ahead with a motion? Go ahead, Robin. Um, and I'm just going to explain this before I jump into it, which is I'm going to. Um, so Jess had mentioned potentially wanting to discuss a condition related to prioritizing access, which I think probably also needs some legal discussion. Um, so I, I'm not going to include that in the motion, but I am going to leave, I'm going to try to include language that will leave this budget open for subject to the future discussion around those two conditions that we currently have outstanding. So that's what I'm shooting for just as a narrative description <laughs> before I jump in. Robin, can I just make a quick comment? I'm not sure that I meant it to be a condition necessarily, but language in the budget order that strongly encourages prioritizing okay. rather than condition. So to be fair, not to put more work on the legal team. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so I will move that we um, approve the University of Vermont Medical Center's budget with an NPR FPP increase of 6% from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22 budget, which will be a 3.4% increase after factoring in fiscal year 21 physician transfers from UVMMC to CVMC, a 6.05 increase in overall change in charge, which is all of which is subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 36, the and the condition 
to address access to care and wait times as previously voted on and uh, potentially subject and leaving it open uh, to an additional condition um, after further discussion with legal. Is there a second? Second. Um, Russ McCracken. So sorry, just it was a 6.34% increase after factoring in FY21 position transfers. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That's the way I understood it. Sorry if I misspoke. <laughs> And I think I heard a second. Did I hear a second? Yes, from Jess. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, is there a board discussion on the motion before I open it up for public comment? Uh, yeah, the only discussion I would have is whether we should um, put that separate condition as, as a separate um, motion rather than hold this up with a potential addition to it. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm indifferent, but I just want to kind of put that out there. Should we approve this as we've gone through and then after um, lunch or when we come back have just a totally separate motion? I think uh, what Robin was trying to do was uh, create some fairness so people didn't think that we were finished, but um, it could be handled either way. OK, I, I just didn't know which was if it was if there was a cleaner way, if it was cleaner to do this. Uh, more consistent with the other motions we've done for NPR and change in charge, and then have a separate motion um, for the other item. But we will definitely have to have a separate motion anyway for the other item. Um, but Russ, if you have, or Mike, if anyone has, I don't have a preference. I just didn't, to Kevin's point, I didn't want people to think uh, we were potentially done done. Okay. okay. Then I'm okay if we continue with this. Okay. So hearing no further board discussion, I'm gonna open it up to the public for comments on UVM MC's uh, budget motion in front of us and Rick Vincent. Good morning. I thought I'd just maybe highlight a few things as you contemplate this. Um, uh, this vote here. Um, one, just to provide some context, I think, to a couple things that were mentioned when the when the present when the budget was presented earlier on. So, one, in terms of the FY21 results, the amount of federal and state funding that the UVM Medical Center has received is 85 million, not 39 million. So, when we're looking at that margin of 50 million, the financial situation this year. Um, as um, has been highlighted would have been even worse. So just to make sure that that context is um, is understood. Um, as we highlighted in our response last week as well, um, like we have uh, many times when we put together a budget this far in advance, um, our Medicare uh, rate increase assumption is no longer valid. Um, and so in addition to the rate um, reduction that's being contemplated um, today. Uh, we also have about a seven million dollar rate assumption for Medicare that is not going to that won't uh, materialize for FY22. So if you were to combine both of those factors, um, that's twelve point six million dollars of revenue um, assumption that um, at this point would be different than what we um, than what we submitted. The last thing I'll point out, just because there was a lot of discussion uh, about expense control um, in our presentation this year, as we've done in the past, um, if you look at slide 47 and 48, the UVM Medical Center compared to other academic medical centers um, is been the last five years near the near the 25th percentile in terms of cost, um, and this is cost from the the provider. Um, uh, perspective, not from the the patient and uh, payer perspective. So, 
Absolutely, there's always work to be done um, to uh, control costs, and that's a focus that we have um, with everything that we do. But again, to highlight the place that we're starting at is a very low uh, cost um, starting point. Um, in addition, we highlighted that the shared services that we provide as a network is starting to have uh, an impact. Um, as a percentage of net patient revenue, um, we have gone down in this year's budget compared to uh, last year. And as before, we have all the systems that will uh, enable us to accelerate um, that cost reduction. Um, so I just thought important to point out those uh, those factors as they're um, as they're connected to the uh, to the discussion that you're currently having. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I see Ham Davis's hand raised. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I, I've just got a quick technical question for Patrick. Um, the change of 7.05 reduced to 6.05. Um, that's the overall charge. Uh, is that the same number that would affect what people call the commercial ask, Patrick? The, in other words, the amount that they could the, could increase the charges to just insurance companies. Yeah, I didn't. Did I not? Did he not hear me? No, I heard you. I'm contemplating your question. Oh, I'm sorry. So are you set? I'm not sure I follow what you're what you're stating or asking. OK, so we'll just just uh, the thing is, you can if you the change in charge, you could imply that that that's a that is simply a number that applies to the charge master that would then apply to all the charges across the whole book of business of UVM. Um, if the the critical number, uh, because it doesn't because because Medicare and Medicaid don't pay the bill anyway, uh, then the real question is how much in in the, in uh, in Robin's motion, how much will UVM be able to increase the charge for care that they purchase that is purchased by Blue Cross? Well, it's my understanding that they don't increase charges by payer; they increase them by service. So I'm not sure I have the number for you, Ham. Well, to Ham's point, this is Robin. I think UVM typically actually requests not a change in charge, but an effective commercial rate. So I should probably change my motion to effect to use that language of effective commercial rate, because I think that was what the 7.05 percent was, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think also if you turn to page 122, because um, in the past, uh, many hospitals don't increase their gross charges the same across each area, but UVM was projecting to do that in their submission. So um, the 6.05 should go across inpatient, outpatient, and professional. Um, and then you can see when you look at the payer type ham, if you were getting to, you know, that won't change Medicaid and Medicare. So it really will just have the impact on commercial and maybe self-pay. Thank you all for that. I uh, I'm not sure I understand it, but uh, that that's probably that's that's my bad. <clears throat> I have a comment, which is simply this: that there's a huge sort of disconnect with reality. That it's not everybody, but it just sort of a sense that goes across this discussion that makes no difference, none whatsoever, what you set for NPR. But you can't run the face of it. They can't get people through there fast enough. The more they put through, the more the NPR will go up. And if you, if you expect something different, then you're living in a cave. So that really doesn't that really doesn't matter. If the UVM, in fact, goes over way over, if they went hugely over, which they did in 2017, um, the NPR and 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 in your judgment, um, too much money then drops to their bottom line. OK, then you can get it back. And it was exactly what you did in 2017. And it was a factor that helped you get uh, and some alleviation of the, the uh, mental health bed problem. So the question really is the, real, the question really is whether you it is is really what you can charge Blue Cross. You can't get any more money out of Medicaid. You can't get any more money out of Medicare. OK, and the, so so the question is, is, is the one that Jessica Holmes raises is, is UVM 
going to get enough. And one of the things I've never heard this board talk about even once, or maybe I missed some, okay? The fact of the matter, and Robin says today, I don't know if I think if we can afford UVM. UVM is the UVM network is cheaper than the state average by 20% and is cheaper per capita across, across its service area from the high places like Rutland, okay, Bennington, Gifford. Those places are 30% higher per capita. And those, those numbers are age adjusted. They're all in the Dartmouth Health Atlas, which was born, by the way, in Vermont. And so, so the question is, so the question, do you want to make UVM? If UVM, if people can't afford the bill, the insurance bill, then what about Rutland? What about Bennington? What about Gifford? Okay. You know, what about, what about the other 1.2 billion in the system? The, I just can't, I don't, I, I, I don't get it. If this board, this, the UVM is the only really serious heavy duty medical structure here. It's all tertiary care. It's all we have. Dartmouth too. Dartmouth is every bit as important to us as UVM, even though we never talk about them. So all I'm saying is, it it is it just sounds ridiculous to me. You the you want to you afraid of this cost? It's too much. It chicken chick chip away here and nickel there, chip away and nickel there. It's the cheapest you've got. Okay, you say nothing about the people that are that are that are way over overspending. Anyway, that that's that wasn't a comment, uh, Kevin. That was kind of a rant. Thank you, Ham. Other public comment. Uh, Kevin, could I just point one thing out? You know, addressing some of what. Ham was saying, if, if, we, if we look at uh, slide 121, um, so on, on 121, you know, you addressed NPR and we didn't put any cap on NPR, but look at the history, you know, 2017, yeah, they were over budget, but it was 4.7% above the prior year, 18, 3.5, 2.5, minus 6.7, 8, and 15.8. And if they don't achieve the 15.8, they certainly have the expenses lined up to go against that, and there could be a massive decline. So, you know, we're putting that responsibility on, on UVM and not capping the NPR, as you said. Um, but it'll be interesting to see next year whether that really came in or not, um, because there's, there's certainly risk there. But the board chose not to cap the NPR, let it come in as stated. Um, and you know, knowing that UVM should be able to manage that to a degree, but um, it's pretty big growth year over year. But, but Maureen, it doesn't matter what you do about NPR; they're going to get NPR. Okay. Public I, comment. I, I agree with you. I agree with public you. Public comment is not a period of debate. I'm going to recognize Mike Fisher next. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, uh, a couple of comments I want to make um, in the context of the UVM budget, though I think uh, it should be noted that that much of what I have to say is uh, applies to many, many Vermont hospitals and the board's consideration of many hospitals. Um, first, uh, I just want to remind us um, a, a little bit of not so ancient history. Um, uh, not too long ago, there was a discussion of a, of a, a one-time COVID uh, bump that would uh, not go into the base. I remember the details of why that came out, and, and that decision last year became um, um, a part of a uh, uh, recognized as as a as an increase, um, not as a separate uh, a separate increase for COVID. Um, and I, and there was discussion at that time about about the importance of being able to back that out. Um, I have missed if there's been any discussion this year about a decision uh, uh, not to back that out. Um, there may have been, and I missed it, um, but I bring it up now because it's my hope that, and, and, it, and it might be a reasonable decision. I'm not debating whether it's a reasonable decision or not to um, to back the uh, the one-time COVID, the discussion of one-time COVID increase last year out this year, but I think that it should be discussed in future years. I want to remind us of that. Um, and then I also wanted to make a more global comment about uh, sort of the meaning of the uh, the bad debt line. Um, it um, 
it, you know, to a hospital administrator, it is something that is written off and 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 goes away. It's a, a an accounting tool. Um, we asked for stories this year about the impacts of medical debt on Vermonters' lives, most particularly the impacts of medical debt on Vermonters' decisions about getting care. And um, you know, it won't it won't surprise you. You hear these stories. Uh, like we hear these stories, but um, but it was relentless. Um, it was uh, uh, a difficult uh, comments to read, and a difficult number of comments to read. And um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it out loud in this context um, that um, uh, that medical debt and the impacts of medical debt on Vermont families pushes in exactly the wrong direction of where we're all trying to go with right care at the right time. It's it's so important that we make progress in how we, in how payers and providers um, um, organize themselves around um, promoting care. Um, but if we don't touch the, the significant pressure on Vermonters, um, um, it will be even harder to make real progress on um, delivery reform. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, board, for your hard work. Thank you, Mike. Other public comment? Hearing none, is there any further board discussion on the motion in front of us? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show it was a unanimous decision. Patrick, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for the next hospital. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And for clarification of the process, can we assume that will be the template for the next two? There will be a motion made on the budget with uh, pursuant to the work that legal is going to do um, around the commercial fixed perspective payment topic. I think it makes sense. OK, all right, we will proceed then. Uh, next up is Porter Medical Center, and I'm going to turn oh, wait, it over. Hold to on a minute, Patrick. Sorry. So I'm I should have actually I'm sorry to do this, but I think I should have amended my motion before we voted on it that to clarify that the 6.05% was the effective commercial rate, not the change in charge. Uh, we, so, as in years past, we didn't receive a specific request for commercial effective rate. We only received the request for the increase to gross charges. And, and quite frankly, the board made it clear that we weren't going to have two different standards, one for okay. one hospital and one for another. So to go back to what what was done in the past, we're just stomping on ourselves. I'm fine with that. It's it's just not how I read this submission, which says aggregate commercial insurance rate increases of not change in charge. But I'm comfortable if everybody else is. I just want to make sure that I'd done it correctly. So hearing nothing, Patrick, might as well presume. OK, uh, as I was stating, next up is Porter Medical Center, and I'm going to turn it over to Kate Hoffman to walk through the hospital's budget profile. Kate. Thanks, Patrick. Good morning. Yes, sorry. Still morning, everybody. Um, so to go through Porter um, for FY21, we're looking they're coming in about 4% um, below their 21 budget. Um, their FY22 request of about 94.1 or $2 million is about 4.9% over their um, 21 budget, which is over the 3.5% growth rate guidance. And they are um, their request is about 9.2% over their 21 budget. To the right for their charges, they're requesting a 5.86 overall charge master increase which is mostly allocated to commercial, but um, some is also going to Medicare um, with a small uh, deduction to self-pay and other. When we look at their performance versus the 3.5 trending, 
they are almost exactly where um, they would be at the pre-pandemic 2019 actuals being pre um, projected 3.5% year over year. Um, it's like $30,000 short, I believe. Um, some of the justifications the hospital discussed, um, which are consistent with other hospitals, are the staffing challenges um, and the desire for capital Im investments to improve their patient access. Um, they discuss also the LNA training program. They want to be sustainable and affordable, and their rate request, rate request, sorry, um, is for incremental inflation only. So if we look at their waterfall graph, their increase um, from FY21 is about $4.3 million. 3.7 of this is utilization, 3.7 million, sorry. Um, 2.6 million is attributed to rate with offsets to the FY21 rate difference, bad debt free care and their reimbursement um, slash payer mix. The uh, operating expense drivers for Porter, um, they're increasing about 2.9 million, mainly due to inflation increases of $2.2 million, uh, equipment and software of $1.7 million, and new positions of $1.2 million. Their offsets include compensation to non-medical staff of about $1.1 million, purchase services of about $1 million, and fridge, fringe of um, about $560,000. So when we look at Porter's quarterly performance, um, they ramped up um, up to Q3 and are projected to drop in quarter four. However, they are projecting um, a positive operating gain for um, fiscal year 21. For Porter's historical performance, this hospital has operated slightly above budgeted NPR FPP from 2017 to 2019 with their missing NPR. Missing? Oh, sorry, got a little feedback. Tom, that's you coming back through. If you could mute yourself, it would be great. Um, sorry, with their, their missing NPR in FY20 and projected in 21, as we discussed earlier, operating margins continue to be positive with a budget of margin of 5.1% in FY22. This is the second highest budgeted operating margin for all hospitals in FY22. Um, also to note in the 2019 and 2020 actuals, Porter has had the highest operating margin across the hospital systems as well. Um, however, what's not reflected in here um, is the money that is used to support Helen Porter, um, which likely also deteriorates their da day's cash on hand a bit. I believe if I remember correctly, they were thinking about $2 million um, last year was going to support Helen Porter. So slide 131 breaks down their charge request, um, the 5.86% um, that they're hoping for. The NPR due to change in charge was about $2.6 million, which we saw in the waterfall graph. Um, the percent broken out by commercial Medicare and Medicaid is shown um, here as well. They, like the um, UVM Medical Center, are increasing this all service areas by 5.86%. Um, again, you can see the breakout of the request to the individual pairs. And finally, with their charge increases, um, if we remember the slide that showed everybody's averages, um, Porter's was zero. Um, but if we consider their commercial rate asks, they were in, uh, in the five-year average, they were about the middle of the road um, when compared to all hospitals. So our next slide shows their, um, their net revenue collection rates for all payers. We can see it dropping overall um, a bit in the 22 budget from 51 to 50% from the projection. However, their commercial collection is slightly higher at 61%. Um, they also 
have charge increases. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, their payer mix shown here, you can see a bit of a shift to commercial um, when compared to the production on the graph on the right. And then finally, um, our recommendation. So I'm actually going to start with the charge. Recommendations to the staff supports a 4% um, charge increase. Um, and we also are supporting, as with the medical center, um, an approved as submitted for NPR FPP. Um, we believe they could make up for the cut in the change in charge in volume. Also, if Porter did not um, make up for this in their charge request in volume, this would reduce their operating margin to about $4.56 million, which is about a $600,000 reduction. Um, they have estimated approximately $2.1 million um, of loss to be covered by Porter at Helen Porter, which is based with our um, based on previous correspondence with, um, with the health network. This would ultimately leave Porter with a $2.46 million operating margin. Um, and yeah, we support the growth is submitted. If we drop it by the charge reduction, the NPR growth would be approximately 4.3%. However, as I said, we believe Porter should be able to make up through the, for this reduction through volume. So I'll kick it off and, and uh, just say that uh, I hate to ever hear the words make it up through volume. And uh, it's one thing to say that it's we're making it up through uh, reducing the pent up demand, but we have to realize that cost is really a function of uh, price and utilization and we should not be encouraging utilization unless it's the right utilization and the right care at the right time in the right place. So um, that's just a pet peeve that I have, but I do support the um, staff recommendations completely. Um, I think that the fact is that it's next to impossible to accurately at the time budgets were submitted um, budget for revenues given everything that has been occurring in the world around us. Um, with that, I do think that uh, um, the 2.46 um, million operating margin after um, um, taking into uh, consideration uh, other expenses is still a, a healthy uh, operating margin. And so I support uh, the reduction to the 4%. Other board members? Sure, I'll go. Um, I also su support this recommendation, you know, as submitted. Um, and um, I do want to point out, and, and I'll refer to Mike Fisher, I've, I've pointed this out every, ever to every hospital that did get a COVID adjustment the year before. So maybe you missed me bringing it up, but I have pointed it out every time. Um, and this hospital did receive 1% uh, in what we would have assumed as a temporary adjustment last year in their 4% rate request. Um, so considering this reduction to 4%, I would for me, that is a factor in, in bringing forward the reduction from 5.86 to 4.0. Um, I'd also point out that they have a similar forecasting um, in bad debt and free care, where the actual in 2020 was 5.2 million, the projected in 2021 is 5 million, and the projected in 22 is 7 million. Um, on a, a $2 million increase on a $10 million increase to NPR. So that's that's a pretty significant shift in how much we would think is going to occur in bad debt and free care. So I would, if things shake out anywhere close to where they are the past two years, then they'll make up that difference in rate change, which is 600,000 um, by their projected budgeted increase of $2 million over the prior year, again, from five to seven on bad debt and free care. Um, so I'm fully supportive of this recommendation. Other board members? Um, so I, I'm comfortable with approving the, the NPR as submitted. 
Um, I think that, you know, those projections are roughly in line with other hospitals and on par with uh, what NPR would have been if we had annualized that three and a half percent growth rate since 2019. So I'm comfortable with it. I also think to the degree that the medical center may have to push down uh, care to a more appropriate setting in its other affiliated hospitals, um, we might be seeing some of that excess demand up at UVM coming back into uh, potentially Porter. So I, I'm comfortable with the NPR. Uh, let me just ask, I would love to talk a little bit about the change in charge because I do think that this subsidy to Helen Porter Nursing Home changes the way I look a little bit at their margin. So operating margin currently budgeted 5.1. If you remove the subsidy, I think, I believe, Porter is really generating about a 3% margin. And if we reduce the change in charge down to 4%, I think we're in, you know, into the well. I think we are under the two percent operating margin, um, you know, in the one plus range. So I guess one of the things that I think about there is that because UVM Health Network thinks holistically, uh, all of the subsidiary hospitals or all the affiliated hospitals, their margins contribute to the the A rating that the health network needs. To the degree that we are uh, decreasing margins below 2% in the uh, subsidiary hospitals, it's putting more upward pressure on what UVM Medical Center needs to gain in terms of margin to get that A rating. So I'm just wondering if the 4% change in charge might be too low, given that need to subsidize Helen Porter Nursing Home and given the need for all of those hospitals to achieve you know, roughly 2% margin to uh, maintain their A rating. So wondered if uh, the budget team had done those calculations to see what, you know, what exactly would the operating margin look like if we cut the rate to four and they still had to subsidize at about $2.1 million to Helen Porter Nursing Home. Am I about right? It's in the 1.5% range. Kate, I think you provided a number when you were walking through that logic, did you not? I had a number, a dollar value. Um, this would leave them if they did not um, make up for the NPR. So everything as is, and they just took the charge out with a two point one million dollar um, transfer to Helen Porter would leave them with two point um, four six million dollars at Porter. Okay, so, so I guess it depends on whether you, you just take your cal calculator and divides that by uh, the top line, then we can get to what that uh, margin is. Yeah, maybe we can ask Lori to take that figure and divide it into the total operating revenues to find a margin uh, for Porter Hospital that reflects the logic that we've discussed. Um, <clears throat> Jess, you make you make a good point about that. Um, however, in UV, I believe in UVM's um, presentation, they were looking at a weighted average on that contribution um, in that medical center would supply the majority of that margin so that the weight of that uh, margin would it be 2.7% uh, if everything falls into order and no expenses are changed or the 3% if they can find the, the savings throughout the year. Um, it would it probably Porter probably wouldn't move the needle that much on based on their logic around the weighted average of the margin that they need to maintain that A rating, if I understood their presentation correctly. But still, we should still talk about what the margin percentage is um, with the reduction in rate and the contribution to Helen Porter. Do you have that number, uh, Lori, at the 2.46 million? I'm working on it. Um, basically, you're asking me to take 2.1 million from the current operating margin and also the additional drop in change in charge or not touching that? Yes, both. Okay, the first one, we're taking the current operating margin of 5.2, we'll say, million, dropping it to 3.2, we'll bring their operating margin to 3%. So they originally had 5.1% operating margin. 
and dropping it 2 million one for the Helen Porter brings it to 3%. And if we include the rate cut on top of that? And the rate cut that we're expecting is worth, how much is the rate cut? Please go back up to the- uh, It's about $600,000. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it brings the operating margin down to almost 2.5. So okay. then the operating margin, that's millions, and then the operating margin percent is 2.5. Okay. And just for me, one of the things I'm, you know, I'm trying to think about is, you know, looking at um, budget and actual. And I think, you know, to me, the actual trumps trumps um, budgeted numbers. And so for 2021, the budget was 6.5 million for free good, free care and bad debt, and the actual is coming in at 5 million. And now for 2022, the budget is 7 million, which is in line with how they were budgeting, you know, in in 21, um, but not understanding why. Um, and the history has been 5 million in, in 20, um, now 5 million in 22, and a 7 million budget in uh, in 22. So that, that's, that's where, um, and, and also when we had gone through the commercial rate changes and how they were kind of putting free care a uh, free back in there um it seems to be inflating that number um so if, if that were reduced even to six million or 6.4 million which would be a significant increase over the five million expected this year and the prior year um you know that that would offset more than offset um this it's going to be what it is i get that but to me, the actual history kind of trumps more the, the budget and budgeting what we did last year similarly, and that didn't occur, so. Okay, can I just ask a quick question? Can you just go to slide 131? I just wanna make sure that I understand because one of the, I think I just heard Kate say it was a $600,000 impact of a 1% change in charge. But I'm just looking at the that uh, the one percent value of one percent change in charge commercial Medicare Medicaid. Um, how does that line up? It's one point eight six, I believe. I think what Kate was saying was the one point eight six percent reduction oh, okay. to four percent would be a value of around six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. Fine, that makes sense. Sorry, just trying to make sure all these things are tying out in my head. Thank you. So I can jump in. Um, I'm comfortable with the staff recommendation um, uh, on both the NPR and the change in charge. Um, I do think to Jess's point that some of the reduction and change in charge could be made up through pent up demand and redirection of care from UVM. Um, and I think part of the benefits of Porter joining the network has been stronger financial footing for Porter, as well as uh, hopefully some continued cost savings from uh, being part of a larger group. Um, so I'm comfortable with that, and of, and um, I think that in in general, um, given that we're still in a pandemic, I am comfortable being a little uh, giving as you know more flexibility to hospitals as we've discussed in our previous deliberations. Um, but I do remain concerned about affordability across the board for Vermonters. Other board members? Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I, I always find Helen Porter a pleasant uh, almost island of reprieve to look at their budget relative to some of the complications in the other. Um, they, uh, if you look at the four-year trend, 2019 to um, 2022 budget, 
their NPR growth trend has been 3.49% and their operating margin, operating expenses have been 3.2%. Um, so they've done well there. Um, the only thing that kind of caught my eye was um, in terms of looking at their budget to budget payer uh, changes, you know, they were looking at eight, eight they, from, you know, from their uh, payer mix, 8.9% uh, increase for Medicare budget to budget, a 16.1% increase in Medicaid budget to budget, but a zero increase in commercial budget to budget, which was they get to by having a 12% decrease 2021 budget to um, 2021 uh, projected and then a 13% increase offsetting from uh, 2021 budget to 2022 budget. So my sense is, I mean, these are always difficult to, you know, have any certainty, but that there, you know, if there is some, you know, with the commercial being at zero built into their budget, zero growth, but the budget that there might be some upside potential there. And uh, um, that would be a good thing. Other board members? Robin, are you prepared to make a motion? Sure. I move to approve Porter Medical Center's budget with an NPR FPP increase of 4.9% from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22 budget, a 4% increased overall change in charge, subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined in, on slide 36. And uh, just with the note that um, we may come back to, with another condition after discussion with legal as discussed earlier. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there board discussion? If not, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? Mike Fisher. Uh, let me take that down. Um, uh, 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 I, I want to thank member Yusufer for um, I have heard you recognize the COVID um, uh, bump from last year, from previous years, maybe I didn't make myself clear. I think what I hadn't heard was a, a board decision about the one-time nature of that discussion last year and a decision about whether to do that in future years. But I, but I, um, but I was remiss it because um, I really do appreciate. I think it's important to appreciate that Member Yusufur has has called this out, um, and I have heard that. And, and thank you. So, Mike, just to be clear, because the uh, language was changed last year, nothing was one time. So legally, you can't go back to last year's decisions. The way you do any adjustments are in the current um, charges and in future charges. And so there's there's no legal way to rescind what happened last year, which was not a bifurcated rate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm I'm fully aware of the dynamics that led to that last year. Um, it, it there was still a discussion, and I know this isn't. I appreciate the opportunity to say that um, uh, the discussion last year. Um, of the importance of, um, though it could not be considered a one time, that uh, many board members um, recognize the importance of, of coming back to it in future years. At exactly the right time to do that, I think, is open for debate. I just uh, am making the statement that I, I think it should be done. Thank you, Mike. Other public comment? Hearing none, the motion before us is to approve Porter Medical Center's budget uh, with uh, NPR FPP increase of 4.9% from 21 to 22 and a 4% um, increase to overall change in charge. 
and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 36 and um, with the recognition that there may be a further um, motion later today or on Wednesday. Um, is there any further board discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was unanimous vote. Patrick, back to you for Central Vermont Medical Center. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will move on to CVMC and Lori Perry is going to uh, walk the board through the hospital profile and staff recommendation. Lori, over to you. Thank you. Uh, Central Vermont. Budget to projection variance was a negative 3.8%. Their FY21 budget was approved at 236 million point one. And their projection was 227 million point one. And their FY22 request is 251.5. Their um, NP the NPR is 6.5% more than their 21 budget and 10.7% more than their 21 projection. They are above the 3.5% uh, growth rate guidance at 6.5%. We will be discussing their provider transfers, which um, changes this slightly, but we'll go to, oh, it changes it to 4.54%, and we will um, show that in a couple slides. They're changing charges, are commercial at just shy of 5.9 million, their Medicaid is a uh, reduction of shy of 200,000. Medicare is a 1.2 million and self-pay and other is a negative 90,000. And they are asking for 7.41% for the overall change in charges. Uh, CVMC's um, performance versus the 3.5% trend shows the budget is 20.9 million more than the trend or 9% more. The hospital's justifications for their budget are an increase in staffing and capital investments to improve patient access. They are seeing an increase in complex care for their acute, excuse me, acute admissions and high ED and express care volumes. And they are seeing boarders residing in the ED. They wanna have an improvement in their margin and then also they have a lot of inflation pressures, the same as all the other hospitals we've been hearing. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the and we've approved these is the provider transfers. They took effect last year in September and they are worth a negative 2% to their NPR. And these were approved in May on May 19th. Uh, CVMC's drivers of the NPR, this is their waterfall chart, they had a budget growth of $15.4 million, and it is made up of their rate effect of $6.8 million, utilization of $6.4 million. Those provider transfers we mentioned are worth $4.5 million. Reimbursement payer mix is $2.6 million, and their FY21 rate difference reduces the NPR by 5.1 million. They also have small drivers such as DISH, increase of 43,000, and bad debt free care of an increase of 134,000. Their expenses, they have an increase of $14 million that they're budgeting for, of which inflation is worth 6.1 million. The provider transfers are worth 5.6 million. They have new positions and vacancies combined and those are 1.9 million. Purchase services are 1.3 million. Fringe benefits are an increase of 1.2 million. Provider tax equipment software are both around 0.6 million. Their wages for non-medical and medical staff are half a million. The traveling nurses are 233,000. Supplies contribute a decrease of 228,000, and drugs are a decrease of 1.6 million. 
And then they are counting for all other expenses have a decrease of 2.2 million. Uh, CVMC's operating performance this last year um, for NPR, they had they, they were for the first three quarters have steadily increased from 54.3 million to 56.3 million to 59.4 million, as shown in this chart. But they are projecting a decline of a negative 3.7% or 57.2 million for their fourth quarter. Their operating margins for the first quarter was a negative 2.4%. Then they reported nearly double that with a negative 4.7% in the second quarter, and then a positive operating margin for the last two quarters of 1% and 0.7% respectively. Their historical performance on slide 139 shows that their NPR exceeded their budget in fiscal year 16 and 17, but they did not meet their budgets for fiscal years 18, 19, 20, and you also see in their projection 21. For their operating margin performance, for 16, they made a $2 million margin, but they reported operating losses for 17, 18, 19, and 20, and they were projecting a loss for 21 at $3.2 million. But for 22, they're budgeting a $2.7 million operating margin. Uh, Central Vermont's change in charge is the 7.41%. And they are having the NPR is changed by the change in charge of about $6.8 million. The value of 1% for commercial is just shy of 800 thousand dollars or 791,000. The one percent change in charge for Medicare is 700,000. The change in charge for Medicaid is about 171,000. They are going to be increasing their service categories for inpatient, outpatient, and professional services by the 7.41 percent. Their payer mix for this change in charge, as we mentioned on the previous excuse me, slide, is commercial is 5.8 million, Medicaid is a negative 178,000, Medicare is a 1.2 million, and then self-pay and other is a negative 90,000. The change in, in NPR is worth 15.4 million, and the change in charge, as we have been mentioning, is worth 6.8 million. This hospital's five-year average has been the overall average for their change in charge has been at 2.3% approved, but their commercial effective weight was 3.7% for five-year average. The um, collection rate for Central Vermont is um, was 50% for fiscal year 18 and 19 and 49% for 20 and projected for 21, but they're budgeting 47% this year. The budget for commercial is 61%, Medicaid is 37%, and Medicare is 38%. The hospital NPR payer mix has shifted a bit. The commercial payers were about 49% in 20 and 21, and Medicaid was about 14% and 13% for those same years. But in 21 and 22, commercial payers changed to 51%, Medicaid went to 12%, Medicare shifted between 36, 38, and 37 percent, and back to 36 percent for the 20 through 22, respectively. Um, Patrick, if we could go to slide 147, please. We thought we would give you a perspective of Central Vermont as a PPS hospital and the growth that we've seen with that hospital compared to Rutland and Southwestern. And we see the NPR growth for Central Vermont for the 2019 through 22 period is great, much greater than the other two hospitals. And their budget was um, higher for all the other years. Um, we've seen the budget growth for them with their CAGR is at 6.5%, but the other two hospitals were 1.8 and 2.7%. For their operating revenue, again, we're seeing Central Vermont as basically like an outlier of those three. 
their CAGR between the years of 2019 and 22 is 6.3%, where Rutland is at 1.9 and Southwestern is 2.5. The bottom graph is showing the operating expense growth. Again, Santa Vermont is the outlier, and their um, CAGR for 19 through 22 is 5.2% for operating expenses growth, where Rutland is 2% and Southwestern is 2.9%. We wanted to kind of like put this in perspective for PPS hospitals of their size. Um, please go back to our recommendation slide, Patrick. So we are recommending that um, we re first we go to the change in charge, that we change in charge from 7.41% to 5%, which equals 1,907,238 reduction to NPR, or a reduced growth rate of 5.72%. And then with the provided transfers, that is 3.74% for the NPR. Mainly we are having these type of reductions or recommendations for this hospital because they hadn't been meeting their budgets through the years. And we think they should be concentrating on their expense reductions so they can meet their margins. And their rate and utilization are their major drivers of the NPR and FPP. So we figure they haven't been meeting their utilization. And uh, Patrick, if you have anything else to add to this particular hospital. Yes, I do. So this was a hospital that we took a long look at uh, as it relates to the history and the request, which falls under everything that we set out in guidance. And so I'll page back to the slides that we're looking at to try to put it into context. You know, southwestern Vermont, from a revenue perspective, is slightly smaller than central Vermont, and Rutland is slightly larger. And we were trying to take a holistic look at why this budget was going over the quarter billion dollar mark from a NPR perspective. And we've had Rutland and, CV and CVMC in here um, discussing it. And certainly a lot of the factors that are driving those budgets are also driving this budget. Uh, there's a, a, a large piece here to be considered is that this hospital has been within the UVM Health Network for many years. Uh, and they have advantages to that affiliation that uh, Rutland as a standalone does not, and that uh, SVMC may share some relative points with uh, for their relationship with Dartmouth Hitchcock in New Hampshire. Um, so when we were looking at this, at the NPR growth figures in relation to their very close peers in the state and in the operating expense piece, we were kind of blown away by that. And that is where our concern comes in about the revenue level that is being put forth in this budget is this is a hospital that has had <clears throat> uh, rates, overall rates that are commensurate with those of Rutland. You can see here on slide 149 that what CVMC has been approved for, for overall rate increases, not effective rate, overall rate increases is 2.3%. And their uh, peer in Rutland is 2.2%. So they are really neck and neck as it relates to that. But yet, expense growth is much, much higher than it is at Rutland, which leads us to believe that there's been issues in controlling those costs. Now, we talked about that uh, during the hearing with UVM, and they have a focus on Central Vermont, as they've stated. But when we go back to that topic of Rutland as a peer, Rutland has controlled costs um, over this period that we're measuring here, and they've produced positive operating margins, and CVMC has not. And CVMC, if it weren't for its affiliation with the network, would have the staff very, very concerned about its financial future. Um, but that said, they do have the benefit of being with the network. We heard from the network leadership that that is a, a major factor in being affiliated with it. So we hope that there will be um, some concentrated efforts to get some of that expense growth under wraps. And if they can meet their uh, top line revenues, then they can produce an operating margin. But at least since I've been here, we've seen positive margins come in uh, every year of budget season and they they don't materialize. Uh, so like I said, that's a big concern for us that the revenue uh, projection going into 22 
has an operating expense projection that's mirroring it pretty closely. And if they don't hit those numbers, uh, we'll be looking at another seven figure loss going through the end of 2022. So I just want to support what Lori is saying <clears throat> with this recommendation um, that we do have concerns about the operating expense piece. We hope that that will be uh, weighted against the need for um, services there very, very closely. I think if anyone has the capacity to uh, really monitor the need to add expenses, uh, it will be the network with the resources and the leadership that they have. But we still have concerns about that given the very recent history of operating performance at Central Vermont. Uh, so <clears throat> just to recap, once we, um, if you were to accept the change in charge reduction to 5%, um, which is still a, a very high rate increase uh, relative to the other decisions we've made this year, um, that would pull about 1.9 million off of the 251. And then when we back out the contribution from uh, the provider transfers, their budget to budget growth falls to 3.74%, uh, which is where we felt uh, that hospital could achieve uh, the revenue growth from that perspective. So <clears throat> with all that said, Mr. Chair, we'll turn it over to you for a board discussion on Central Vermont. Thank, thank you so much, Patrick, and I'm going to open it up to the board for discussion. Board members? Uh, sure, I'll go. Th this, is a, this is a tough one. Um, they've had challenging budgets for several years. So if we look at slide, um, slide 139, um, so I, I guess first my underlying one underlying concern is is I agree with the staff on will they be able to hit the 251 that they have for NPR. And when we look from 2018, 19, and 20, the misses at NPR uh 4 million and 18, 3 million and 19, and and you know, quite a bit more um obviously in 20, but just looking at 18 and 19 and then going down to operating margin they clearly when they miss the top line have not been able to make any adjustments to their expenses and so they've been running at a loss for many years so so that's obviously a concern in will they be able to show that growth um even if even with the staff recommendation i think it brings it to a 9.8 percent growth from year-end projection to 22 budget um, so, so that to me is, you know, is potentially a challenge whether they'll achieve that or not. This, this, if this weren't a network hospital, I agree too that uh, there would be a lot more concern on on whether they would be um, sustainable. Um, that said, a couple things. When you go to slide one forty five, um, I think you know relative to comparisons to Rutland and SVMC. Um, and you know, this is just one in one indicator and it, it's it's not an exact science, but you know, SVMC and Rutland are their commercial to Medicaid rates are double. And I'm sorry, to Medicare rates are double. And CVMC is 142. So they're the lowest um, ratio. Their Medicaid ratio is is a little bit higher, so so that may may indicate that you know their Medicare is is a little bit, um, you know what the reflection of that would be to Medicare as well. But that's concerning to me there. So I I know you know all those efficiencies that you just looked at for CVMC to Rutland and SVMC. Part of it might be related to this. Maybe they're actually you know a little bit underpriced relative to the others. So, so that's one factor um, to put in there. The other one is if you go to the cash flow page, which is um, days cash on hand, 153. Um, and I, I exclude SVMC obviously has the parent, so, so that's not a relative comparison. But when we look at CVMC, 
they are the lowest, um, except for Copley, which we know has a whole bunch of money that's going to come in and increase that when they clear their PPS and some of their CARES Act money, uh, Springfield, which we talked about, and then SVMC, which has an issue um, you know, because of their parents. So, so those things are making me then go look at your com the commercial rate um, recommendation reduction, um, which I think may be too high. And um, really just because of the financial trouble they've been in and they continue to be in. Um, they did have last year a 7% and it was 4% uh, base and 3% COVID. So I know that's a factor too, but I would just be a little concerned with um, lowering them. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at maybe a 6% rate, you know, because, because of their impacts they've had before on being able to manage their bottom line. So not to say they should be relying on rate, but, you know, we have been approving 6% for several of the hospitals. And so I would be willing to put forward going to a 6%. Um, the other concern I have when you look at their P&L is exactly what you guys were pushing for before, which is the expense increases. So in 2020, um, their operating expenses were $235 million. In 2021, um, excluding the COVID um, one-time money for vaccinations, it's $246 million. And they're projecting $266 million in expenses in uh, 22, aligning with that revenue of um, $251 in NPR and then, and then with pharmacy and things like that at 268. So, you know, I have a concern of them, A, hitting the top line and B, being able to manage those expenses um, at the 266. So I think that that's really just pointing forward to the hospitals. I'm not saying we can reduce that, but certainly this is one that there's going to have to be a really close watch on, are they hitting the top line? Because their history has been, they don't hit the top line, they don't cut the expenses, they lose more money. Um, so, so this one, you know, I just kind of put out a lot of things out there as a challenge to me, but, um, you know, was trying to align that again, kind of where their ratios sit, where their cash sits, which I have been focusing on, on a lot of the hospitals. And, uh, you know, I, I think, um, want them to get on track and hopefully in the future they can be managing that expense to revenue, but I'm, I'm concerned that the going down to five is, is going to be too much of a challenge for this hospital um, who I think still needs, has a ways to go before they're able to improve their financials. Other board members? Other board members? Is my mic working? Yes, it is. It is. We're all thinking. Maureen just gave us a lot to digest, Kevin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess I'll just start. So, um, you know, I share a lot of the concerns around the top line that Maureen outlined, even with potential for excess demand, potentially from UVM to shift down to CVMC. I worry that their submitted budget is again aspirational, you know, and and the you know, Lori went through it, Maureen went through it, but when I look at the, you know, 2009 NPR growing at three and a half percent, you know, it's hard to imagine coming anywhere close to the 251 million. Um and you know, one of the things that the narrative talks about uh the volumes for all three hospitals generally returning to pre-COVID fiscal nineteen levels. Right, so they're expecting this this huge increase in NPR, but they're also projecting their volume for all three hospitals to return to pre-COVID-19 uh, levels. And with EPIC implementation at CVMC, I, I would expect there's got to be some downward adjustment below even potentially, you know, 19 levels. Just if we think about, depending upon, you know, I don't know where to think. So much uncertainty here: pent up demand, shift of care from UVM. But you also have EPIC implementation in there, which we know has an impact on productivity. So there's so much unknown here, but I still find 
it hard to imagine them hitting their budget. So I support, I think, the reduction that the staff suggested here uh, that feels uh, better to me with a commensurate reduction in expenses so that they can achieve that margin, uh, particularly given their abilities to hit their projections, which we know they've overestimated their revenues year after year and generated operating losses. So the hope would be that if we drop that NPR, they drop their expenses, they'll have a chance at, at making a margin. Um, what I'm thinking about now is the rate request, of course, is on the high side when compared to other hospitals in Vermont, you know, and, you know, they've been affiliated with the UVM uh, network for the longest period of time. So I would be hoping that we would start to see some of those gains from affiliation, right? The benefits of economies of scale translating into lower rate requests. So I'm, uh, I guess I'm, I'm open to more conversation around the 5% or potentially, as Maureen just put out there, the 6%. But, um, you know, when are we going to start to see, you know, gains from affiliation leading to lower rate requests than other similar hospitals, right? We had Southwestern had a 4.8, Rutland had a 3.6. You know, you're looking at other hospitals that were able to manage uh, lower rate requests. So, but I recognize also some of the points that Maureen made about their base, their commercial to Medicare ratio. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm fine with the NP, the staff's recommendation on NPR, and I'm open to conversation around what that change in charge should be. So I'll jump in. Um, I am comfortable with uh, the 6% change in charge, um, recognizing that uh, what really I think focus it for me is a factor in looking at all the different um, comparisons that we've just gone through is the commercial to Medicare ratio, which um, is significantly lower for CVMC than, for example, Rutland. Um, and so that is persuasive to me in terms of being comfortable with the higher rate request. Um, I also agree that um, the NPR is high and seems aspirational. So I would be supportive of reducing that. Um, I don't, I haven't myself landed on a specific number, um, but um, certainly in the range of what the staff recommendation would be seems reasonable to me. And I pretty much agree with, you know, all the other points that Jess and Maureen raised. So I'll, I don't need to repeat them. Okay, Tom. Didn't realize my camera was off. Um, I think I, I'm, I land here supporting basically wh where the staff is looking at the kind of way I structure these things. Um, you know, their NPR trend rate uh, from 2019 to 22 budget is 6.5%. Uh, their uh, operating expenses are 5.2%. Um, I think they're a little rich in the provider tax in that their uh, uh, 2020 payment was a 5.5% payment, but they uh, are in for uh, uh, 2021 uh, projected over and uh, 20. 22 budget at 7.03% and 6.45%. So I think there might be some cushion there. Um, and their, their revenues, I think maybe there's some up, some upside there. They're looking at Medicare going from 2021 budget to 2022 budget from 89.7 million to 91.5, Medicaid from 30.7 million to 30.6 million, and commercial, um, a heavier lift. From 114 uh, to 128, but that would be uh, with, with the rate increase. But I also uh, keep in mind that they are part of the network, and the network has a lot of very um, talented people working for it, expensive talented people work for it. And uh, and uh, this you know Porter is probably you know not a difficult hospital for them in terms of uh, worrying about it and. 
and obviously they've got to worry about UVM Medical Center and and this one. But uh, because they are part of the network, um, um, I'm not as uh, generous in my uh, um, you know, wanting to help them out financially. I I I think there's obviously some operational issues here, and uh, uh, it's it's up to the network, I think, to kind of solve this. So I, I, I can go with the staff recommendation. So I too could go with the staff recommendation. The only thing that would uh, um, really question me on whether or not it should be a higher rate is knowing that um, hopefully by the end of this year, we will have um, some movement on a CON for the inpatient psych beds and so I get nervous that uh, I would not want to do anything that would jeopardize um, the financial footing for the institution that we're expecting to move forward on, on this project. Um, but I, as I said, coming in today, I, I was prepared to support the uh, staff recommendations, but whether it's the five or the six, um, it, it's not gonna prohibit me from voting for this. Robin, are you at a point where you think you could make a motion or? Um, I would just ask. Um, it sounded Maureen and Jess um, what they were thinking about in terms of NPR. It sounded like. Um, I'm just not particularly clear on. That piece of it. For me, Robin, I support the staff's recommendation on NPR. Yeah, I would, regardless of what we do with the change in charge, so, so if we make it six, which would obviously create less of a reduction related to the change in charge, I, I would still look for uh, the staff, I'd still support the staff recommendation up top, um, and I still think that is a stretch. Um, and, you know, hopefully with all the analytics that the network has, they can be looking at that and, and justifying that because um, this hospital could have a significant loss next year if it can't cut expenses corresponding to where the top line may be achieved. And they definitely have a history of missing their budgets um, and having losses every year, so. Thank you, okay, so that's where I thought you were both were, but I just wanted to make sure I was clear. So I'm going to move to approve Central Vermont Medical Center's budget um, with an NPR FPP increase of 5.2% from fiscal year 21 to 22, which will be a 3.74% increase after factoring in. So Robin, did you mean 5.72? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, which will be a 3.74% increase after factoring in fiscal year 21 physician transfers from UVMMC to CVMC with commensurate reductions in oper to operating expense growth in the aggregate in order to protect margins, a 5% increase to overall change in charge and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 36 with a note that uh, we will consider potentially an additional condition as discussed earlier. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it. Okay, there's been a motion and seconded board board discussion. Yeah, just to be clear, I'm not at five, I'm at six, but um, that's okay. It's yes, seven. and actually, I'm not at five. I'm at six. I just got Kevin flustered me with when I misspoke with the five point seven two. So I'm going to amend my motion to change the overall chart change in charge to six percent. I think I need some lunch. <laughs> I'll second okay. this. I'll, I'll take I'll take uh, that uh, um, suggestion, Robin, and uh, it is um, one minute away from that that uh, twelve forty five. So. Um, at this point, we're going to go into recess for two hours, give the legal team um, a chance to uh, do some work and give us all a chance to uh, make sure that uh, we're thinking clearly on a nourished body. 
So with that, this meeting will be in recess until 2.45. I'm reconvening the meeting, and at this point in time, we had left um, at a point where Robin had made a motion, but um, had asked to um, change the language of her motion. And so I'm going to go back to Robin and um, start with her. Robin? Thank you. Actually, now that I'm my blood sugar's back up, what I'd like to do is actually withdraw the motion and start over. That would be good. Is the seconder okay, okay with that, Tom? I think it was me, and yes. Okay. Great. Okay, so I am going to move that we approve Central Vermont Medical Center's budget uh, with an NPR FPP increase of 5.72% from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22 budget, which will be a 3.74% increase after factoring in the fiscal year 21 physician transfers from UVMMC to CVMC with commensurate reductions to operating expense growth in the aggregate in order to protect margins, a 6% increase to overall change in charge and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined in slide 36. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, I'll open it up to board discussion. Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment. I do see a hand raised and Rick Vincent. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, just a few uh, few things that, um, I'd like to, to point out. So one, um, just to, to highlight that earlier we were looking at the, the net patient revenue growth for CBMC compared to the expense growth, uh, uh, taking a look at that change year over year um, compared to a couple other hospitals. And just to point out that, um, that one of the things that has been increasing expenses at CBMC, and it has more of an impact for them than when you look at, you know, a budget that's, that's larger, um, like the UVM Medical Center, is that as the outpatient pharmacy business increases, that adds pharmaceutical costs that actually doesn't generate additional net patient revenue, it generates additional non-patient revenue. Um, so just to, to highlight that, that that point, particularly when you look back, uh, going back to 2019, there's been you know, fairly significant growth um, in, that, uh, in that expense line. The second uh, was just to put some context around uh, what uh, board member Yusufer pointed out in terms of the commercial rate increase as a as a percentage of um, of Medicare. If you were to just move, um, you know, CVMC ten percent up that scale, and they were to move a little bit further along the. Um, and get a little bit closer to Rutland and some of the other hospitals at the upper end of that um, that scale. Um, that's almost six million dollars for CBMC. So it doesn't take much um, of a change there to to start to really change the uh, the outlook and the of the margin for uh, for CBMC. And then the last uh, point uh, that I just wanted to make is that. Um, certainly going into the first quarter of the new fiscal year, um, I just want to um, probably set some expectations that we already, uh, with what we're having to do in terms of uh, salary adjustments, uh, tools that we're putting in place to attract and retain um, staff and providers are already essentially outstripping the inflation assumptions that we have uh, in our budgets. Uh, where we're currently at in terms of traveler usage, as you probably have seen in some of the exhibits, are um, are well above our 2022 budget, and it's going to take time for that to uh, to come down. So, in the first quarter of the fiscal year, at least um, you know expense reductions with those pressures that are already outstripping um, the FY22 budgets uh, will be you know, obviously something that will be difficult for uh, CBMC and other uh, hospitals to, to tackle while they're 
will certainly be a focus on expense savings. Um, a lot of those expense savings could end up being um, consumed by um, those inflationary pressures and the fact that we still have uh, a lot of travelers in our uh, in our run rate. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Is there other public comment? So we'll shift back. The motion in front of us is to approve CVMC's budget as modified hereby with an NPR FPP increase of 5.72% from 21 to 22 budget, which will be a 3.7% increase after factoring in 21 physician transfers from UVMMC to CVMC with commensurate reduction to operating expense growth in the aggregate in order to protect margins a five a six percent increase in overall change in charge and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 36 and um just uh commensurate with a possible further discussion uh after the budget is there any further discussion from the board I just, I just wanted to say I appreciate Rick uh, making uh, his comments and points in terms of clarifying areas. It doesn't change my vote, but I do appreciate that. And I am um, I just want to say I'm sympathetic to uh, some of the challenges in the current environment. OK, is there any other board discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion passed unanimously. And Tom, now I'm gonna to go to you for an explanation. Can you? Or do you want me to go to Russ? Uh, no, you can come to me. Um, I I, uh, I lost your sound there for a minute, though. Um, can you hear me? I can, yes. OK, so we had a good little chat. Um, it's uh, I think that we all agree that um, something is uh, pretty much out of balance when, you know, the the kind of gross amount of uh, carrier uh, payments to hospitals is around one point six billion and only uh, three-tenths of 1% of that is engaged in some kind of uh, healthcare reform uh, program. Uh, it's a, a meager 4.7 million, whereas in Medicare, uh, the, the participation rate in the FPP is um, around, uh, well, it's like exactly according to our payer mix tables, 33.8%, and for Medicaid, it's 42.9%. So to have this huge player um, in in the healthcare market um, not engaged in the programs that are now getting mature for um, uh, uh, you know uh, population based or fixed pr perspective um, payments just doesn't make sense. On the other hand, given the magnitude of it, it's also very complicated. So. I think, uh, and this was a, you know, this was a meeting on the run, but uh, um, I feel comfortable that, um, you know, there, there, there is some sorting that has to happen between our established rate review process and hospital budget review process, and maybe others um, like the sustainability project to make sure that we're not, um, uh, um, you know, stepping on each other's toes, and that we have the bandwidth in order to do this stuff well. Um, so uh, that's an important consideration, um, and that that over the coming weeks and so we should or, or we should be map out a a board um, uh, process that is consistent with existing rules or integrates uh, or amends existing rules to to find ways to bring this huge resource uh, that's out there now independent of healthcare reform. To bring it um, in line to some degree, um, and uh, so uh, and also I think there's some hope, you know, but it's it 
things uh, unfold faster than people um, anticipate, you know, that we, we might have um, some idea of where we're going um, or, 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 or how or we're getting there um, uh, prior to uh, budget guidance for 2023. Um, so it's, you know, it's aspirational, as uh, Maureen would say, this is as an aspirational, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, to me, it's, I, we just got to get the train on the tracks and, and start moving uh, down our rulemaking process because $1.6 billion is a lot of money. It's bigger than Medicare and bigger than Medicaid. And, uh, and to have it kind of sitting independent of all the efforts that everybody's making in so many levels in terms of healthcare reform just, just doesn't make sense. Um, and so in order to kind of uh, end this, I think Robin has me uh, withdrawing my motion from in the morning, which which didn't didn't exist at five o'clock in the morning. So that that creation at five o'clock in the morning uh, has had a life that it never expected. And but at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, I I withdraw that emotion if if that's the right way to do it, Robin. It makes sense to me, but it is of course up to you, Tom. Um, I think you've outlined, you know, that there's definitely some work. Uh, for us as a board to think about how to move forward across all our processes and, and make sure that we're supporting the effort to move towards these kinds of payments. So I, I like the idea. I hope that we can have a fuller board discussion about that at some point sooner than later. Um, but I think it, that makes sense to me to do it. And the holistic approach makes sense. And to Jess and Maureen's previous comments, since it wasn't in guidance, I think for me at least, it you know it feels like we're not changing the game midstream, but giving people notice that um, we're interested in pursuing this line. Agreed. So, Tom, um, since you and Robin were the maker and the seconder, I'll consider the uh, motion having been withdrawn. Um, that, that, yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay. Um, Russ, did you have anything to add? No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't want to reiterate what, uh, board member, uh, Pelham has said just, just now. Um, I think that there will be a next step, uh, as a presentation to the board of some, uh, different process options um, for the board to uh, consider and, and provide some direction on um, not not necessarily exclusive options, but um, whether the board wanted to pursue a rulemaking option um, and or development uh, of some benchmarks for the FY23 hospital budget guidance. Okay, thank you. So, Russ, Patrick, are there any further motions that uh, you envision needing, or has everything been done that needs to be done in order for the, the written um, orders to begin? I believe we've captured everything for this budget process. Yes, uh, agreed, and there's nothing else I'm uh anticipating um that we would additional orders that would be needed here thank you so this would probably be the uh, appropriate time for me to uh thank a number of people kevin before i'm sorry to jump in before you do that uh, did we get a request for reconsideration from brattleboro and when were we going to talk about that if yes, we did receive a request from for reconsideration. And does any board member wish to reconsider? I I wasn't necessarily prepared to bring it up today, but um, because it I did see it late on Friday, so I just wasn't sure if we were gonna. It seems like we would need to, even if we didn't want to reconsider, that we'd have to then deny the motion one way or the other, but. Russ should correct me. Like we'd either have to grant it or deny it, I think. So we'd have to look at it at some point. Is 
Is it a formal request for reconsideration? You have not seen it, Russ? And no, I'm sorry, I have it here. Yeah, I agree with I agree with Robin that um, the best course would be for the board to um, for the board the best course would be for the board to um, consider whether they want to reconsider the. Uh, Browboro decision, and if not, uh, to have a motion not to reconsider it. Should we pull it up? I mean, I do not want to reconsider it. They they basically want us to uh, not not do the NPR reduction that we took, and they were one of the higher NPR gross over over projection over ten percent, and they have a history of not hitting their numbers. And quite frankly, I didn't uh, um, see any urgency to this reconsideration because um, NPR is something that um, if there are solid reasons why they exceed it during this crazy year that we are in now and coming up into 22, I can't understand why we would seek enforcement if there were valid reasons for it. So, um my opinion was not to reconsider, but again, I'm just one board member. Patrick, do you have thoughts? I believe the staff would keep the decision as is. Board members. Yep. Well, I didn't spend. I would I keep did. as is. Okay. Uh, I heard Maureen say as is. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, me too. I, I, you know, I, I, I did read the letter and I went back and looked at the material and I couldn't see any reason to, to, uh, to reconsider. Jess or Robin. Yeah, I'm in the same camp. Um, uh, thinking that we can leave it as is for the points that you mentioned. Um. And obviously, if they are running hot, I hope that they will come back and talk to us about that. Um, but I'm comfortable leaving it as is. And Robin? I'm, I'm comfortable with that approach. So why don't I move uh, to not reconsider Brattleboro's uh, budget at this time? Or to deny the motion for reconsideration? I think that would be a cleaner motion. All right, I, I move that we deny the motion for reconsideration. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to deny the request for reconsideration. Is there any board discussion? I just wanted to chime in and say, or maybe I, I'm sorry, maybe I did say this, but I do think if to Jess's point and your point, Kevin, if there if there does seem to be a need, I do hope that they would come back in the future. Other board comments or questions? If not, I'll open it up for public comment and turn to Mike Del Treco. Sorry, I was on mute. I apologize for that. Um, I uh, just wanted to ask a process question. If if I know the folks from Brattleboro were on the phone this morning and not of it and and aren't available right now, is there a situation where this would be noticed as a different meeting to take this up, or so they could comment or be available? That would be my only thought. Thank you. So if this motion passes, Mike, that's that's the end of the request for reconsideration at this point in time. I understood. I just wanted to know where it wasn't on the calendar to uh, be taking up today, and and they're not on on the call. Um, if there was any procedural things uh, where it wasn't on the calendar specifically. 
Is is let me rephrase this another way. Mike, are you asking that um, we postpone action on this motion until the next uh, regularly scheduled board meeting? Um, uh, Chair Mullen, I'm not necessarily asking for postponement. I'm I'm asking um, for consideration where they're not on the call and it wasn't scheduled to be taken up. If that's procedurally okay with you, you and 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 your process, there's there's no way I could sort of re require or request a postponement. So it, it well, was just. Well, Mike, I'm inclined to grant your request um, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> I'll just chime in out of order here. I think it probably does make sense to take it. We have a meeting scheduled for Wednesday. I think to Mike's point, the agenda said hospital budget deliberations, which is somewhat vague. So it it's probably difficult for them to know whether or not we would. So to me, it's just a little bit cleaner since we already have the meeting scheduled if we push it to Wednesday and that way we can make sure Brattleboro knows that we'll discuss it then. And that gives them an opportunity to make comment. And Robin and Kevin, thank you for for uh, hearing me. And I've been trying to notify all the hospitals sort of when they're coming up to sort of help with some of that clarity. Um, and I know that it's a difficult thing and everything's on the fly, but where this was a uh, air quote reconsideration, that's why I, I reached out and, and provided comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So unless there's objection from a board member, member, we'll put off this discussion until Wednesday morning. Yeah, that's fine. One request I would have is, can we do normal start one o'clock start on Wednesday? I don't think we have anything else on the agenda. You're pushing me now. I got to look at the the uh, the calendar. Or can we can we do a ten o'clock start? I just have an appointment I can schedule. Um, one one o'clock um would work. Ten o'clock uh would work. It's for me. I don't know about other board members. Either works for me. Works for me. Which works better for you, Maureen? Yeah, let's do 10. That's fine. OK. So the meeting will start at 10 o'clock on Wednesday for uh, the purpose of discussing Brattleboro Memorial's request for reconsideration. So I think I will go ahead, though, and uh, you know, make some thank you notes to uh, people at this time and get that out of the way so I don't drag it out on Wednesday. And um, to start, I want to thank our um, hospital budget team, Patrick Rooney, Lori Perry, Kate Hoffman, a lot of work. And uh, this was one of the better presentations that I can uh, remember in my years here at the board. So thank you for everything that you've done in your analysis. Um, but I do want to prepare you because next year I'm going to expect even more. And the reason why I'm going to expect even more is the person that I want to thank next. Um, back in May of 2017, um, when I was notified that um, I was being appointed to this position, um, the person that came in with me at the same time was Maureen Yusufer. And Maureen has been an incredible asset to the board and her financial analysis um, has been extremely helpful and is going to be missed. So, um, Patrick, we're going to be asking you to even um, do a little bit more next year because um, we won't have Maureen with us, but we're all going to miss you, Maureen. And I wanted to uh, say that at a public meeting, that it has been a pleasure to serve with you and how much uh, we value your contributions to the state of Vermont and your public service. So thank you, Maureen. No, thank you as well. I wasn't wasn't prepared for that today, but um, you know, my term ends September 30th and um, I was not prepared to be able to sign on for another six years, but you know, really everyone that I've encountered during this process, I've been impressed by on, you know, all sides. and. Um, you know, I guess as I'm partying out here, 
you know, if you're to remember me, maybe it's uh, I was firm and fair. So <laughs> hopefully, uh, you know, that, that will uh, represent. And I'm sure I'm going to encounter a lot of people um, not leaving Vermont and, um, you know, ho hope to be able to share stories with all of you on all sides. So thank you very much. Thank you, Maureen. And I also want to thank everyone at the hospitals who have put in countless hours um, preparing budgets, reviewing them, going back to the drawing board, um, answering questions, and everything that they've done. And I know that uh, no matter what, that in these hospital budget hearings, we never please everybody. And if we did, we probably weren't doing our job. So, um, there is a couple of housekeeping items that I do need to take care of. First, uh, Abigail informed me that we have not approved the minutes of 9-1 or 9-3. Would someone wish to make a motion at this time to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of 9-1 and 9-3 without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So that cleans up um, that item. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, again, we will meet at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. And at this time, a motion to adjourn would be appropriate. I so move. Second. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>